This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. If you've watched our military shows, you know something about weapons. You might know that the USA has spent a mind-boggling amount of money on the F-35 program. But did the program justify all that money? That surely depends on America's future military actions and the effectiveness of its super and super expensive multi-role fighter. We can, however, look back through history and see that some weapons were more effective than others. In this show, we won't point out the obvious, such as spear, sword, bow and arrow, gun, or the atomic bomb. But we're going to look at other more specific or unusual weapons that were particularly useful in times of war, and perhaps a surprise for enemies. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, the most successful war weapons ever invented. The Bayonet A military website wrote a piece in 2018 with the title, How the Bayonet Changed the World. Okay, it's just a dagger or sword fastened to the end of a gun. But back in the past, this was a battle game changer. The name is thought to come from the French city of Bayonne, so the first bayonets may have been French. They are still used now and could be used to stab someone at close range or even taken off and used as a survival knife but it's the past when they were most useful. Guns were not quite so automatic back then, and when soldiers were reloading, or should we say preparing their musket, they had an excellent defensive weapon. If the other side didn't have bayonets, this gave them a big advantage. The bayonet may not have been more important than while at the Battle of Culloden in 1746, when the Scottish Jacobites were outnumbered by British redcoats. As a historian said, in addition to practicing volley firing, the troops were taught a form of bayonet fighting. The first time in the British Army that the use of the bayonet was the subject of tuition. Even though these days it's more of a multi-purpose tool, in the past if you had bayonets, plus training, and the other side didn't, you certainly had an ace in the hole when it came to fight time. The Hand Grenade Types of grenades go all the way back to the 15th century, but those were the types of things you might have seen Looney Tunes characters use, like a round shell with a fuse on it, something that never quite seemed to work for poor Wile E. Coyote. It seems again it was the French that used these things first, and they had people that threw them called grenadiers. Fast forward to the First World War and armies were filling cans with stones or bits of metal and then packing them with gunpowder. These were far from effective, sometimes killing those that made them. The race was on to create a safe grenade that could easily be thrown. In 1915, the British had what you might call a modern looking grenade, the egg-shaped thing with a pin and lever. This was called the Mills Bomb. But by that time, the Germans had the stick bomb. Apparently, the stick bomb could be thrown further, but packed less of a punch. One thing's for sure, these little bombs were soon indispensable. The Cannon The Chinese invented many things in their glory days that some historians say they haven't been credited for, but they have been credited for the invention of the cannon either in the 12th or 13th century. Firing objects long distances by using gunpowder again was a game changer. It was of course much faster and more devastating than hurling massive stones from giant catapults. Historians are not quite sure when the first European cannons came about, but there is a picture of a cannon dating back to 1326, and not long after, the English were using them in the Hundred Years' War. One Florentine historian writes about the Battle of Cersei between 1345 and 1346, when the England and Welsh easily defeated their opponents. The whole plain was covered by men struck down by arrows and cannonballs, said the writer. It's written that English peasants destroyed French knights during the battle. Why? They had this new weapon. But it wasn't just the English. Armies from what we now call the Middle East were using these things as well as in other places in Asia other than China. The RPG while we're on the subject of bombs being thrown through the air, we should mention the invention of the rocket-propelled grenade. Gizmodo tells us that these things were created first by the Soviets to attack tanks. There were such things as anti-tank guns, but something better was needed. It had to be very powerful, and also something that could be moved around easily on the back or in the hands of a soldier. The Soviets came up with the RPG-40 in 1940, which was a very basic version of what we see today. The Americans then introduced their version, calling it the bazooka. The Germans had the Panzerfaust, but it seemed for years to come it was the Soviets that mastered the RPG. Tanks 
talking about blowing up tanks, we should discuss the first tanks. These were also game changers, but who came up with this idea? The Imperial War Museum tells us that it was the British that invented the seemingly indestructible machine, and it was first used on September 12, 1916 at the Battle of Fleur Cousolette. We're also told that the Brits used the word tank as they wanted no one to find out what they were developing, and so by using that word, enemies would think they were creating giant water tanks that would replenish soldiers in the trenches during World War I. The tanks were called Mark I's, and they were slow and unreliable. It's said that in that particular battle, only 25 of the 49 tanks actually moved forward. Still, this fearsome machine made an impact. The French soon had the Renault FT light tanks, and the Germans would soon create their own beasts on caterpillar tracks. The Gatling Gun You've probably seen those Wild West movies where someone pulls off a sheet on the back of a cart and on it sits a Gatling gun. In those days, it was like pulling out a lightsaber. In the movies, everyone is quickly shot to pieces. It was invented by American inventor Richard Gatling and first used in 1862. This gun is said to be the first kind of machine gun, and it was used in the American Civil War, and also to easily take down tribes of Native Americans. In true American fashion, it was widely exported. It was used by the British to shoot down spear-wielding Zulus in Africa, by Imperial Russia to cut up Turkmen, and by the Peruvians to surprise and kill the Chileans in 1880 at the Battle of Tacna. The drone. Unmanned military aircraft are used to attack or spy, and these things were also a huge game changer. While some people think shooting people from the sky in a foreign country from the control room is unethical, others say they save lives. The ethics, of course, are related to whether the taking of lives should be done in what seems like a video game playing environment. Recently, Google employees voiced their concerns over Project Maven, something the company was helping the Pentagon with related to using artificial intelligence to go through thousands of hours of drone footage. But when did modern drones start being used? The Nation writes in a story called A Brief History of Drones, with the invention of drones, we crossed into a new frontier, killing that's risk-free, remote, and detached from human cues. The story tells us that the CIA first used a modern killer drone, called a Predator drone, to find and kill someone on February 4, 2002. A Hellfire missile was fired from the skies at the target, Osama bin Laden. But we're told that the US Navy had unmanned air torpedoes as early as World War I although not even remotely, excuse the pun, as sophisticated as drones are now. From the 50s to the 70s, drones were still being used and tested, but mostly for flyover missions. They couldn't really be controlled like modern drones. It was computer technology that changed everything. It's said the Pentagon these days has around 7,000 aerial drones. Soon these drones may be piloted in a virtual reality environment rather than on a 2D screen. No doubt coming will be more advanced machines that move and shoot using machine learning technology and recognition AI, and perhaps those machines may one day be able to move like humans or animals, as was depicted in the dystopian tech-based TV show Black Mirror. Immediately after the end of the First World War, the navies of the world were taking inventory and preparing for a future conflict. Ships, unlike most other weapon systems, have very long procurement schedules and take years to design, build, test, and finally be operational and ready for combat. Therefore, the first few years after World War I would decide what the navies of the future would look like. For most, business continued as usual, with the battleship and its mighty deck guns being the centerpiece of naval power. The battleship, or dreadnought, had ruled the seas for decades after all. And before it, during the Age of Sail, frigates loaded with multiple decks of cannons had been top dog at sea. In 1920, though, American General Billy Mitchell had a different view of things. Mitchell had paid careful attention to the evolving role of the airplane during the First World War. Initially, it began nothing more than a reconnaissance asset and then a fighter aircraft loaded with machine guns. By the end of the war, the first bombers were being fielded, and it was these aircraft that caught Mitchell's attention. Compared to traditional artillery, early bombers were seen as having little use. Artillery could fire relatively quickly, and expert gun crew could fire off almost two dozen shells a minute, a considerable amount of firepower. In comparison, bombers of the time could only carry a few dozen pounds worth of bombs. But what they lacked in sheer firepower, they more than made up for in range and precision. Aircraft could travel a hundred or more miles, and the pilot could ensure great accuracy in their delivery, as opposed to the blind, probing strikes so often used with artillery. The ability to deliver bombs at range is far greater than any cannon, 
and with more accuracy gave General Mitchell an idea, and one he brought up with his senior Navy leadership. Using a captured German battleship, Mitchell tried to convince US leadership that the future of naval combat was not the big gun battleship, but the aircraft carrier and its armament of fighter and bomber aircraft. In 1921, Mitchell proved the validity of his theory by sinking the German battleship Ostfriesland via aircraft in a widely publicized demonstration. The onlookers were shocked, as to date no one had thought a battleship could be sunk by such flimsy weapons as aircraft, and yet the US Navy brushed Mitchell aside, saying his demonstration proved nothing. Amongst the observers, though, were two Japanese officials who, unlike the American admirals, saw a great deal of potential in Mitchell's demonstration. The rest, as they say, is history. Today, the modern aircraft carrier finds itself in a similar moment in history a hundred years later as the battleship did during Mitchell's time. For eight decades, the aircraft carrier has been the backbone of any serious navy with its ability to strike from hundreds of miles away with high-precision weapons. The US's supercarriers alone each hold enough firepower to rival the air forces of entire nations, and together make up the second most powerful air force in the world. Yet the time of the aircraft carrier's supremacy is quickly coming to an end, and many fear that the US's continued investment in big supercarriers, like those of the new Ford class, are going to place it in a strategically perilous situation in the next major conflict. Already, aircraft carriers make up almost half of the US Navy's budget, and while they bring incredible capabilities to any conflict, they are increasingly vulnerable to weapons being developed or already deployed by powers such as Russia and China. Hypersonic and wave-skimming missiles can be fired from hundreds of miles away or from hard-to-detect submarines and in enough numbers to overwhelm a carrier battle group's defenses. Ballistic missiles such as those deployed by China can threaten aircraft carriers from a thousand or more miles away and can be launched from mobile and thus difficult to detect and destroy platforms from deep within enemy territory. The economic cost of aircraft carriers and the increasing capabilities of anti-ship weapons is also leaning heavily in favor of non-carrier forces, with China for instance being able to buy over a thousand anti-ship missiles for the price of a single US Ford-class carrier. So if the future looks set to dethrone the aircraft carrier as the premier naval combatant, then what does a futuristic aircraft carrier actually look like? America is firmly committed to its acquisition of Ford-class carriers and plans to have at least 11 supercarriers operational through as late as 2070. Many, including former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, have all criticized the vulnerability of supercarriers to current and future weapons, but the Ford-class carrier is built with the future in mind. Unlike its predecessors, the Nimitz class of carriers, the Fords are built from the ground up with the capability to modularly install future technological upgrades. Its current systems, for instance, only consume half of the energy each Ford carrier can produce, meaning in the future each ship will be able to install futuristic technologies as they become available. Chief amongst projected technologies that the Ford and other futuristic carriers will be equipped with is rail guns and directed energy weapons. Currently, carrier battle groups rely on intercepting missiles to fend off an anti-ship missile attack or incoming ballistic missiles dropping down from space. While a formidable defensive system, it is limited in how many targets it can engage by the physical amount of missiles available, how fast it can engage each target, and how much time it has to respond to incoming targets. Currently, fleet missile defense relies primarily on enforcing a bubble of safety around the carrier through the use of the combat air patrol and anti-submarine warfare assets. The Combat Air Patrol, or CAP, engages incoming aircraft at long range and anti-submarine drones and helicopters, as well as accompanying attack subs keep enemy subs at a safe distance. However, today's anti-ship missiles have ever-increasing ranges and accuracy, and ballistic missiles can be fired from thousands of miles away, placing both systems well out of the range of the CAP or ASW measures. Once detected, incoming missiles moving at hypersonic speeds may give the defenders as little as 30 seconds warning before impact. Today's Aegis cruisers can respond with a volley of two interceptor missiles every seven seconds or so, giving a cruiser four chances to destroy an incoming missile before impact. When faced with a small number of anti-ship or ballistic missiles, the odds are good that they can be defeated, but a future opponent will not be deploying these weapons in small numbers. Instead, they'll fire in very large volleys meant to overwhelm fleet missile defenses, and this is where directed energy weapons and railguns come into play. Railguns promise the ability to track and deliver rapid-fire salvos of kinetic interceptors against incoming missiles. 
far exceeding the firing rate of an Aegis cruiser's vertical launch cells. Directed energy weapons such as laser beams and particle beams fire at the speed of light and can burn out missile warheads at long ranges, then shift to a second target in a fraction of a second. Both systems will help keep future carriers safe from incoming missile attack, though they will likely not be coming online in numbers for at least a decade. Another future upgrade for aircraft carriers will be an armor upgrade designed to defeat or at least minimize the damage from missile strikes. Current anti-ship missiles used shape charge warheads to penetrate thick ship armor, and as they impact they produce a jet of ionized gas that cuts through steel like a hot knife through butter. While still highly classified and in testing stages, dynamic or electrically charged armor promises to help mitigate the damage of missile strikes. To protect the ship, the armor is fitted with two thin shells of material separated by an insulator. The outer shell holds a huge electrical charge, something that will not be a problem for Ford class supercarriers, and the inner shell acts as a ground. When a missile strikes the armor and creates a superheated jet of conductive metal, it penetrates both shells and creates a bridge between them. This causes the outer shell's electrical energy to discharge through the jet and disrupt it, limiting the amount of damage it can do. While still in early testing over at the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory in England, the technology holds great promise and one day it's hoped it can be deployed on armored vehicles and even to protect from traditional kinetic weapons, perhaps making science fiction shield technology something of a reality. Despite these technologies though, many still argue that the future of the aircraft carrier is not to go bigger and better, but rather to go smaller, much smaller. The loss of a single supercarrier will be a $15 billion economic hit for the US, and mean almost as many casualties as in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict combined. Supercarriers bring a lot of firepower to the table, but they are also big, slow, and very vulnerable to ever more advanced anti-ship capabilities. So why not then, some defense insiders argue, go smaller rather than bigger? Some argue that the future of the aircraft carrier will be a fleet of much smaller carriers with a capacity of 20 to 30 aircraft, as opposed to 80 plus which America's supercarriers can field today. Larger numbers of smaller carriers will mean that the loss of a single carrier will not represent a significant hit to the naval capabilities of the American Navy and ensure that the US air power can remain in effect over a contested shore. Today, even if a carrier is not destroyed, it can receive what's termed a mission kill, meaning that the carrier is no longer capable of launching and recovering its aircraft, and cannot continue fighting. A single volley of missiles may not knock out a supercarrier, but it could very well render it useless for the remainder of the war, and along with it a significant amount of perfectly functional air power. Dispersing that air power over a fleet of smaller carriers, however, ensures that the majority of aircraft can continue with their mission if a single carrier is rendered a mission kill, and that carrier's own air wing can be reassigned and spread out across the rest of the fleet to continue the fight. In all likelihood though, even these developments in carrier protocol and technology simply won't be enough to keep the carrier as part of future naval operations. Advancements in missile technology are rendering carriers far too vulnerable to risk near enemy shores, but those same advancements are also making the carrier obsolete much in the same way that they themselves make battleships obsolete a hundred years ago. Future missiles will have much increased ranges and even greater accuracy, making the need for actual aircraft to deliver them obsolete. Instead of carriers, a future navy may consist of a fleet of robotic arsenal ships loaded to bear with dozens of varieties of missiles, allowing them to carry out the same missions an aircraft carrier currently undertakes at a fraction of the risk and a fraction of the cost. In the words of the infamous Tony Stark, the best weapon is one you never have to fire. We've come a long way since sticks and stones, and it's almost inconceivable that only a few hundred years ago, man was still waging war with bows, arrows, cannons, and muskets. Modern militaries are constantly in the process of developing new weapons, some of which will definitely make some mouths drop. We thought it would be fun to take a closer look at the most amazing offensive and defensive weapons currently in the works in this episode of the Infographic Show, Top 10 Weapons of the Future. Number 10. High Energy Liquid Laser Area Defense System, or HELADS, is a system that will use a 150 kilowatt laser, powered by a lithium ion battery, to destroy any rocket, missile, artillery shell, or mortar heading toward its bases. It will also be offered, apart from a standing structure, as an airplane mounted system. General Atomic stated in 2015 that the preliminary tests had been passed and that issues with the quality and accuracy of the laser beam have been overcome. This project is presently being financed by the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, 
and the plan is to have the laser model mounted on the Drone Avenger by 2018. Number 9. Guided 50 caliber Bullet This bullet is being developed by DARPA's Extreme Accuracy Task Ordinance, or EXACTO, and has already completed its first round of testing. It will be able to move and change course to hit targets. This will be used specifically for snipers, but once perfected will be applicable anywhere. The live fire tests have shown the bullet to maneuver in flight to targets. The point is to avoid the sniper's need to adjust for weather and wind, and to have these adjustments built into the rifle itself. The press release accompanying the test stated, True to DARPA's mission, Exacto has demonstrated what was once thought impossible, the continuous guidance of a small caliber bullet to a target. A live fire demonstration from a standard rifle showed that Exacto was able to hit moving and evading targets with extreme accuracy at sniper ranges unachievable with traditional rounds. Fitting Exacto's guidance capabilities into a small 50 caliber gun is a major breakthrough and opens the door to what could be possible in future guided projectiles across all calibers. Number 8. Quantum Stealth Definitely one of the stranger developments in the field of camouflage, Quantum Stealth technology is a form of electro-optical camouflage that strives to make its wearer invisible. Duke University and Stealth IR are two institutions currently engaged in research on bending light beams around the wearer. This is meant to fool night vision goggles and long-distance optical equipment rather than an up-close viewer. This new technology will manipulate light around the wearer so as to fool even the unaided eye at close range. According to David Schurig of Duke University, more crude versions of this have been out for some time and that microwave radiations as a means of detection will soon be rendered obsolete. The purpose is to bend light around the object rather than bouncing it off. Bouncing light rays is how the human eye sees anything. A fabric that can redirect light can deprive the eye of the light needed for sight. The process is called negative refraction, which moves the light in an unnatural way. So far, this has only worked at great expense and is not ready to be made into a material anytime soon. Number 7. The Long Range Strike Bomber the US Air Force is currently developing the B-21 Raider. It will be able to deliver a bomb deep inside enemy territory under stealth cloaking. Many of the details are highly classified, but they should be ready for operation by roughly 2025. The purpose of the bomber is to invisibly reach any point on Earth. It will have the high payload capacity of the old B-1, but with far greater range. It will also contain an advanced air defense system on board that could shoot down planes from hundreds of miles away. The US Air Force plans to purchase between 80 to 100 LRSB aircraft at a cost of $550 million each. Number 6. Electromagnetic Railgun The Electromagnetic or EM Railgun Launcher replaces fuel or gunpowder to shoot projectiles and uses electricity instead. Magnetic fields created by high electrical currents accelerate a sliding metal conductor or armature between two rails to launch projectiles at 4500 miles per hour or Mach 6. Inside each projectile, there are navigation sensors and processors for guidance, navigation, and control. The railguns will most likely be equipped on large naval units. The absence of high explosives necessary for gunpowder-based munitions on ships will improve safety for sailors and marines. Each projectile can hit a target over 100 miles away. If you would like to see the railgun in action, we've created a second YouTube channel called The Military Show featuring live footage of the United States military. The link will be displayed at the end of the video and in the description. This is also probably a good reminder to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos like this. Number 5. X-51 Wave Rider is a 14-foot unmanned scramjet aircraft capable of traveling at Mach 5 at 70,000 feet, meaning that a report of enemy activity in a region could be instantly acted upon. In its current form, the X-51 does not carry explosives and relies on its kinetic energy to destroy enemy targets. The X-51 will be very difficult to intercept by air defense systems due to its speed. The US Air Force and DARPA are working together to complete the X-51 Wave Rider by 2023. Number 4. The Centrifugal Gun Like the electromagnetic railgun, the centrifugal gun is also designed to replace fuel or gunpowder as the accelerant for heavier automatic weapons. The popular term for it is the Dread Gun and it's basically a machine gun capable of firing 120,000 rounds a minute. Because it uses force, it has no muzzle, noise, or flash. And because it doesn't really look like a gun at all, it can be mounted pretty much anywhere. It is a mass of metal which has no heat signature or recoil, and each bullet follows the other with only 1 32nd of an inch in between. Dread's ammunition will be 308 and 50 caliber round metal balls that will be spun out of the weapon at speeds as high as 8,000 feet per second. 
Dread's complete lack of recoil will allow it to be fired from space-based platforms, i.e. satellites, without knocking them off of their respective orbital paths. Using non-lethal rounds, it could potentially revolutionize riot control. Number 3. The Sonic Blaster or Thunder Generator This is an innovation that can change warfare entirely. In essence, these are cannon-fired shockwaves. Think Arclight from X-Men The Last Stand, only much, much more destructive. Crude versions of this have been used in the past, but a military-grade Sonic Blaster is still in development. The cannon uses oil-based fuel systems to generate the wave, increasing in intensity as it travels the length of a cannon barrel. A burst can travel up to 1.25 miles a second and can be fired in 60 to 100 bursts per minute. Being hit with a wave has both physiological and psychological effects. It is technically harmless, but it feels the same as being shot. At a higher rate of intensity, it can cause death with greater efficiency than a bullet. Presently, Israel is building a non-lethal version of this to control riots and strengthen border security, in effect replacing rubber bullets. Number 2. The Zombie Gun No, it's not a gun that kills zombies, it's a gun that turns people into zombies. The Russians are presently testing this low-frequency radiation weapon that at certain levels can affect brain cells and thus psychical states. It is also possible to transmit suggestions to enemies. More crudely, this radio blast can be used to temporarily disable higher cognitive functions in its target. As a lethal weapon, it can be used to burn its target from the inside. The radiation burst can affect the central nervous system and, in effect, short-circuit executive functions of the brain, thereby turning its victim into a zombie. For decades, military technologists have been working to develop weapons that can incapacitate a person by attacking the central nervous system, and previous research has shown that low-frequency waves or beams can affect brain cells, alter psychological states, and make it possible to transmit suggestions into someone's thought processes. Number 1. The Powered Exoskeleton This technology, which can be used for purposes other than the military, is meant to give superhuman powers to its users. Presently, DARPA is testing a military version of this set of powered cables to provide mechanical assistance to one's muscles. The exoskeleton was formulated by Harvard University's Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. In a sense, its purpose was to create a super soldier that can march long distances without becoming tired. Also, the new liquid armor being tested can stop a bullet. The military version of the exoskeleton features a liquid armor that instantly becomes solid upon the exertion of any force. The Raytheon version makes all physical exertion seem 17 times less than what it really is. The system uses flexible hoses that increase freedom of movement and agility, and it features powered limbs providing superhuman strength to its wearer. Think Colonel Quaritch in Avatar kicking Jake Sully's ass. Swords, stone monuments, and nanotechnology. Ancient tech was a lot more advanced and a lot stranger than you might know. Here are some of the craziest ancient inventions scientists still can't explain. Number 11. The Calendar of Warren Field the Scottish team responsible for preserving ancient and historical sites in the region wasn't looking for a historic discovery when they were exploring the grounds of Crothis Castle near Aberdeenshire in 2004. But that's exactly what they found when they discovered some anomalous terrain as they flew overhead. A closer exploration revealed that it wasn't just uneven ground, it was large pits, 12 in fact, arranged in a very precise way as if they meant something. And as the team examined their location, it became clear they had a much deeper meaning. And what they discovered has thrown everyone's understanding of ancient cultures for a loop. The pits aligned along the southeast horizon and seemed to point to a precise topographic point that matches with where the sun rises during the midwinter solstice. This meant that in a very rudimentary way, the people using it could use the location of the pits to gauge the passage of time, and more importantly, the passage of seasons. The earliest calendars known to man were previously believed to be made in Mesopotamia, around 5,000 years ago. But when scientists dated the grounds, they were in for a big shock, because the calendar of Warren Field dates back a whopping 10,000 years. During this time in Scotland, not only weren't there scientists and astronomers, there weren't even villages. The people who used the calendar were most likely hunter-gatherers and nomads who relied on migrating animals for food and pelts. Thus, they had likely used the calendar to predict when in the season they should pass by after plenty of trial and error. What scientists can't explain is how this very early lunar calendar was designed and how the knowledge was passed down to build it. And it's led many to ask exactly how much did prehistoric people understand that we don't know. But sometimes the biggest mysteries are the most humble. Number 10. Roman Concrete The buildings of ancient Rome are stunning, tall, detailed, and incredibly durable. 
Wait, how are they still standing and looking habitable 2,000 years after they were built? Your local school was built just 20 years ago and you're pretty sure raccoons have eaten their way into the walls. Sure, maybe the school cut some corners, but Rome had their own secrets. The concrete used to build their buildings is so strong and durable that even buildings submerged underwater haven't degraded much, and many buildings, like the Pantheon, could be mistaken for a modern masterpiece. And the secret is all in the construction. Roman concrete was mostly similar to the concrete used today, working as a binder that could seal stones and prevent water from leaking in. But there were some key differences. For one thing, it was usually coated with stone or brick, and its components were larger than the sand-like texture of modern concrete. It hardened over time, but unlike today's concrete, cracks didn't form. This was mostly due to the inclusion of pozzolanic ash, an ash from a nearby volcano. Together, it created a waterproof, highly resistant seal that holds up even today, after thousands of years of exposure. So, why aren't we using it today? The problem is scientists know the basic components, but they don't know the secret sauce. It's been 2,000 years, and many chemical compounds have changed. The volcanic ash used isn't available now, and whatever the exact formulation of the Roman concrete was, scientists and architects haven't quite managed to crack it yet. However, because it would be so cost-effective, tests are ongoing to find the next best thing. Tests mixing concrete with coal fly ash are ongoing, and it's believed that this could make buildings last longer and cost less to build. Who knows, maybe they'll keep those raccoons out one of these days. It's not the only technology people would love to have today. Number 9. The Ulfbert Swords Discovering weapons in Europe dating back a thousand years isn't rare. It was a bloody place, with constant wars between kings and skirmishes between tribes. But in northern Europe, archaeologists started noticing something odd. They were discovering ancient swords throughout Scandinavia. They were unusually well-preserved and covered with runes and inscriptions, and they also had one major thing in common. Every single one of them was marked with the name Ulfbert. But who the heck is Ulfbert? Historians investigating the swords quickly dated them back to the 9th to 11th centuries and noticed that not all of them seemed to have the same production methods. However, many of them used production methods that weren't common in Europe at the time. One even used a unique type of steel that was typically found in Central Asia, thousands of miles away, which made it all the stranger that they had the same inscription and had found their way to Northern Europe. The name carved in them was of Frankish origin, so scientists believe that they might have come from what's now the Rhineland. But that still left many unanswered questions. Ulfbert swords kept showing up around Europe, mostly in Scandinavia and in the Baltic Sea, and soon there were a grand total of 167. While some were in fragments, all were in good enough condition to be analyzed for their construction and dating, and that didn't give many more answers. The most common solution for the origin of the swords is that the steel might have been looted or traded and was then altered into blades, but that doesn't explain the varying techniques used or who the name belongs to. It could have been a traveling swordsmith who put his marks on the swords he made, or maybe a chieftain with a very big ego who wanted everyone to know the sponsor of the blade who killed them. We know what the swords are for, but this next item is a complete mystery. Number 8. The Festos Disc The Palace of Festos is one of the most important archaeological sites on the modern-day island of Crete, dating back to the Minoan era. Inside, archaeologists found thousands of items of interest, many that helped illuminate how the people of the era lived and one item that they couldn't explain at all. It was an ornately decorated clay disc, carefully shaped and covered with hundreds of markings. It was clearly something that whoever carved put an enormous amount of time into, and the odds are that every mark on the disc has a deep, profound meaning. The problem is we have no clue what any of it means. Discovered in 1908 by an Italian archaeologist, it has a total of 242 markings and 45 different signs, all made while the clay was still soft by pressing hieroglyphic stamps into it. It dates back over 2,000 years. And much like the famous Voynich manuscript, it's proven to be completely indecipherable. Some claim it's likely a script reflecting a story, maybe a religious text. Others argue it's more likely an alphabet or a system of symbols reflecting locations or events. But no one's gotten any closer to the clue, because it's the only item of its kind, and no other item with those symbols was found in the palace or anywhere else, which has led some scholars to come up with an alternative theory. Could the Festos disc be a forgery? While some insist that the entire thing might be a wild goose chase, most people who have explored it up close and personal do think it holds up. The clay seems to match with other items from the same time period, and a forgery of this level would be extremely hard. Many of the markings do reflect current things like people walking, tools, ships, and animals, but no one's sure how they work together or what they mean. 
With no additional context to work off, it seems the Festos disk will be keeping its secrets for a good while longer, unless a codex is waiting somewhere deeper in the island of Crete. Sometimes few things are more mysterious than the written word. Number 7. The Codex Gigas Medieval manuscripts are normally short and to the point because before the invention of the printing press, even the smallest text was an effort. The craftsmen would usually work on a single piece of parchment, painstakingly writing words and making illustrations, and even the slightest slip-up could ruin days of work. They were typically crafted by monks who devoted their lives to this challenging task, but nothing was ever found on the level of the Codex Gigas, the largest illuminated manuscript in the world at a whopping 3 feet long, 20 inches wide, and 310 pages. The illustrations are more detailed than the average, and very vivid, and in some places, terrifying. That's earned it the sinister nickname The Devil's Bible. Not just for the distinct portrait of a wide-mouthed reptilian Satan, but for one factor. Most analysts of the text believe it was put together in a relatively short period, faster than a single monk could have done it. The similarity of the illustrations indicate it was likely one hand that crafted it, and that's led to a dark legend about the creation. They say a monk had broken his vows and was about to be put to death, but vowed to create a manuscript that would bring glory to the monastery. When his hand was about to give out, he asked for help from Satan himself, who gave him the energy and vision needed to complete it. After all, how else would he have such a clear picture of the devil? Needless to say, this is probably all medieval lore, but the book is so large and detailed that it likely would have been a lifetime opus for a single monk, and the analysis of the text does not indicate it was crafted over that long. That means it was either a team of monks with an uncanny ability to mimic each other's style, or one monk with the world's strongest work ethic. The Codex survived being taken as spoils of war and even reportedly once survived a fire at the Royal Library in Sweden and injured a bystander when the massive tome was thrown out the window. Kind of puts those book reports you had to do into perspective. It wasn't the only ancient text with a lot of unanswered questions. Number 6. The Sumerian King List Most artifacts don't go back much further than Sumer, one of the first great kingdoms. Based in what's now Iraq, it was a powerful nation that had many kings, and like other nations, they were proud of their history, proud enough to keep their names on one of the most impressive architectural and artistic feats on the kingdom the Sumerian King List. This epic work of kingdom's history was carved on clay tablets, and unlike the Festos disk, we know enough about the Sumerian script to be able to decipher it and unlock its many secrets of the kingdom's history. But in some places, the text raises more questions than answers. Many of the kings it mentions are known to be historical figures, others have little record of them beyond the clay tablets. But what makes this list odd is that it isn't limited to historical fact. It contains references to mythological figures like the ancient demigod Gilgamesh, one of the very first fictional or mythological figures ever to have stories written about them. And that's not the only place where it diverges from known history, because the tablet features a story of the Great Flood that sounds suspiciously like the iconic tale of Noah's Ark. What's up with this strange mix of real figures, fictional figures, and tales that cut across cultural lines? There are a number of theories, one being that it might be a mix of fact and fiction akin to how many scientists view the Bible, tales of historical figures and events combined with cultural myths. But how did two societies hundreds of years apart come up with the same story about some great flood wiping away everything that came before, possibly as a symbol of divine wrath? It might be that the great flood did come, devastating the region enough to affect multiple kingdoms and have the tale passed down from generation to generation. If there was a greater explanation for it, every society might come up with its own. It's probably the most famous ancient building of all time, except it's in the wrong place. Number 5. The Pyramid of Hellenikon The Great Pyramid of Giza and other Egyptian pyramids are among the biggest tourist attractions in the world, and everyone knows what they're there for. Ancient, ornate burial grounds for the pharaohs, usually just made to be a little bit bigger than the other guys. Other pyramids around the world are usually known to be temples, but located in the plains of Greece, the remnants of two pyramids stand. They look suspiciously like the Egyptian ones, have the same basic structure, and enough of the pyramids remain for exploration. There is just one problem. No one has any clue what it was meant for. The most well-known of these pyramids, the Pyramid of Hellenikon, was initially assumed to be a tomb like its neighbors. But you know what they say about assuming. No bodies were found inside, nor any alternative pieces of evidence like cremation urns. If this was a resting place for a very important person, all evidence of them was long gone. Also surprising, there were no references to the massive structures in any major Greek texts. A similar building was mentioned in a text by Pausanias as a mass grave for soldiers who died during a particularly pitched battle, but that structure is gone and evidence of the larger pyramid's purpose is long gone, and the search for answers continues. 
The pyramid was first fully excavated in 1937, and the archaeologists exploring raised the possibility that it might have served as a heavily fortified guardhouse for soldiers to keep watch. The only foreign objects found inside were shards of ceramics and lamps, which might indicate that the place was occupied by living beings rather than deceased ones. However, a lot of debate remains over the dating of the pyramids and ultimately their purpose. These pyramids were much smaller than the Egyptian counterparts, but maybe even more mysterious. But no archaeological site puzzled scientists like the one in Bolivia. Number 4. Tiwanaku and Pumapunku Stonehenge, Easter Island, the world's full of ancient sites that seem to be made out of stones far too large to be transported by humans with no mechanical help. Some might have been assembled by pulley systems and a lot of elbow grease, but the 1,500-year-old site in rural Bolivia is on another level. Not only is the ancient construction made out of massive carved stones that weigh hundreds of tons each, but the stones seem to be extremely even and polished and don't display any telltale chisel marks that would represent the humble method of construction at the time. And that's not the only strange thing about it. Located at the edge of a lake in the Bolivian Andes, these sites are believed to be sacred locations for the Inca people, with those following the traditional faith holding it as the location where the world began. The massive structures are far more advanced than those found in other Inca buildings, leading scientists to believe that they might have had help from other local cultures in pre-colonial South America. A close relationship with the local Wari tribe who had more advanced architecture may have made the difference. But that still doesn't answer the question, how the heck was this massive temple built? The largest of the temple stone blocks is around 131 tons, with hundreds of these multi-ton building blocks being placed in shape. While the site has degraded significantly since it was built and access today is strictly controlled to avoid any more damage to the structure, those allowed access have found ornate carvings on the buildings and statues of gods and mythological figures are found throughout the site. While scientists can speculate on how the massive structure was put together, those responsible have taken their secrets with them into the annals of history. But this next site seemed to defy the laws of physics. Number 3. The Oracle Room of Hal Suflaini The Maltese temple-building culture was among the most impressive in the ancient world, with them building massive structures over 5,000 years ago that still have impressive remnants today. Serving as a sanctuary in a necropolis, the Hypogea Mahal Saflaini has been fascinating archaeologists since it was rediscovered in 1902. The early days of the excavation were chaotic, with workers throwing out artifacts and remains to avoid construction on a new housing process being derailed. But it was eventually discovered, and what was left turned out to be one of the most impressive finds in archaeological history. But it was one room in the building that continues to fascinate and confuse. Constructed in three levels, entirely underground, the upper level contained many rooms for burial or residence. The lower level seemed to be a grain storage facility. However, the middle room was the most ornately decorated and seems to be a massive religious facility. One room named the Oracle Room was the smallest of the four and had a heavily painted ceiling. It wasn't until people entered the room and discussed their findings that they realized what made it so unique. Because the second they opened their mouth, the words were projected across the temple. The Oracle Room has a unique property of magnifying and producing a powerful acoustic boost for any sound made within it. It's believed that this was a way to spread prayers or holy texts to everyone within the massive facility. But how was this actually achieved? Perhaps it was just a quirk of the construction, or maybe the ancient Maltese designers actually understood the science of acoustics far better than people thousands of years later. The chambers only explored carefully to avoid causing further damage, and don't speak too loudly or you might hear a rumble. This next invention has home decor specialists everywhere green with envy, or is it red? Number 2. The Lycurgus Cup It sounds like something out of Harry Potter, a glass chalice that appears to be red in color. But when you tilt it the other way, it suddenly transforms and is a bright, comforting shade of green. But it's not a magical artifact, it's a real cup, dating back to the 4th century Roman Empire. And it was one of the most puzzling ancient artifacts ever discovered. This kind of optical illusion is hard to pull off even today. So how did Roman designers manage to pull it off thousands of years ago? The secret is something that is thought not just to be far beyond the Romans, but a tool of the future. The cup's magic trick isn't the only impressive thing about it. The glass carvings on it are incredibly detailed and focus on a bloody battle of the mythical king like Kyrgyz. But the secret of the glass isn't obvious, it's buried deep inside. The crafting of the glass has multiple levels and starts with the traditional Roman glass. But it has a secret, mixed into the formula is a tiny portion of silver and an even more minuscule percentage of gold. They combine together into an alloy and that creates an effect that changes the color of the glass as it reflects light. It sounds simple, but not so much. 
Analyzing the glass gave away the secret, so why can't anyone recreate it with today's glass? If designers had their way, there'd be a modern Lycurgus cup on every kitchen table next to the bobbleheads. There have been many attempts, and a 3D printed material came the closest, but the exact proportion and makeup of the glass was incredibly hard to recreate, and the Lycurgus cup remains one of the most fascinating artifacts of the ancient world. But no ancient technology has captivated the world like this one. Number 1. The Antikythera Mechanism the year was 1901 and a group of divers near the Greek island of Antikythera discovered an ancient shipwreck. They hoped to find treasure, but they found something else entirely. It looked like a collection of heavily degraded trash, but upon cleaning it, it became clear that it wasn't just scrap metal. It was a carefully designed machine full of massive gears, although it had obviously been degraded due to all the time spent underwater. It belonged to a large machine, but it was from an era where massive machines shouldn't exist. What was the strange secret that the divers had just discovered? The device, nicknamed the Antikythera Mechanism, had long since fallen apart, so the bigger question was, what the heck was it? Multiple components of the machine were removed from the shipwreck, and scientists went to work on what was essentially the most high-stakes jigsaw puzzle of all time. Some theorized it was an astronomical clock, but others said it didn't make sense for the time period. Options for recreating the device were limited in the early 1900s, so it went to storage for decades. But as time marched on, so did answers. It would be almost 70 years later when scientists created an X-ray and gamma-ray image of the 82 broken fragments, and from that came a theory. The Antikythera mechanism may have been the world's first computer. It used over three dozen gears to follow the movements of the moon, sun, and predict eclipses, and mirror the orbit of the moon to help ships in navigating. At least that's the best guess. And this strangely advanced technology dates back to over 2,000 years ago. So that raises the question. What other advanced technologies were created by the ancient Greeks and are lurking in shipwrecks deep below? At the end of World War II, two important generals from two of the victorious Allied nations celebrated the end of the war in a very simple and wholesome way by sharing a good old-fashioned glass of ice-cold Coca-Cola. Little did either of these great men know that at the time, this simple moment of celebration and camaraderie is why Soviet Russia invented clear Coca-Cola. One of these great men was General George Zhukov a highly decorated and popular Soviet general. After earning commendations for his actions as a cavalry commander for the Red Army during the Russian Civil War, he studied military science in Russia and Germany. A dedicated Bolshevik, Zhukov worked his way up the ranks of the Soviet Army, serving as chief of staff during the Winter War with Finland before being promoted to chief of staff for the entire Red Army. During World War II, Zhukov was appointed as commander-in-chief of the Western Front. He organized and oversaw the defense of Leningrad and Moscow, and was credited with driving the Nazis out of Central Russia. As Marshal of the Soviet Union, the most important command during World War II, he led the final and victorious assault on Berlin in 1945. His bravery and leadership before and during the war earned Zhukov a place at the table as the Soviet Union's representative at Germany's formal surrender, and it was at this meeting that Zhukov had had his first fateful taste of Coca-Cola. The most important leaders and generals from the victorious Allied nations were gathered in Berlin on May 8, 1945 to accept Germany's formal surrender. Zhukov was there as the Soviet Union's representative, and he was tasked with reading the terms of Germany's surrender aloud to the gathering of high-ranking military leaders, which included the renowned U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Moods were high as the Allied leaders celebrated their victory, but they also used this opportunity to try and shore up their alliances with each other. That could be why Eisenhower decided to take his opportunity to share a glass of America's favorite soda with his Russian counterpart. If Coca-Cola is the quintessential American drink, how did Zhukov end up tasting it in decimated Berlin at the end of the war in the first place? Well, believe it or not, Coca-Cola played a big role in the US's World War II war machine. Before the war broke out, Coca-Cola had already become synonymous with the American way of life and American values. During the war, countless soldiers wrote home about how they were really fighting for the little things, like a nice cold glass of Coca-Cola, rather than for bigger political ideals. At the outbreak of the war, the Coca-Cola company allowed all soldiers in uniform to buy a bottle of Coca-Cola for just five cents, but that was just the beginning of their wartime activities. In 1943, General Eisenhower wanted to boost the morale of his men on the front lines who were missing the comforts of home and the familiar luxuries like soda fountains. Eisenhower decided that bringing soda to the soldiers on the front lines was just the thing to boost morale and keep his men's spirits up. 
he sent an urgent telegram home asking for 3 million bottles of Coca-Cola for his men, along with the equipment to clean and refill the bottles. The Coca-Cola company did him one better. They sent him 150 of their own employees to the front lines to oversee the installation and management of several new Coca-Cola bottling factories near the action. Although they weren't technically in the army, these employees were given military uniforms and were treated as officers, which led them to being affectionately nicknamed the Coca-Cola Colonels by the grateful men on the front. Coca-Cola was strategic about their marketing during the war too. They promoted Coca-Cola as the taste of home and the drink that fights back and marketed the drink heavily to soldiers on the front lines and workers on the home front. Their taglines were focused on Coke's ability to bring people together, with have a Coke, a way of saying we're with you. They even encouraged workers and soldiers to take a break and enjoy a Coca-Cola, the pause that refreshes, because it would apparently make them more efficient according to research conducted by Coca-Cola's executives. By the end of the war, 64 new Coca-Cola bottling plants had been built in Europe and North Africa which worked out well for the Coca-Cola company in the long run. GIs were eager to share their favorite drink with the locals as they liberated towns and cities all over Europe, effectively creating a huge new consumer base for Coca-Cola in Europe. Many of the bottling factories remained open after the war as Coca-Cola focused on expanding their reach internationally and becoming the world-leading refreshment company. Some places, though, remained stubbornly opposed to Coca-Cola and all that it represented. After his first sip of the sweet caramel soda, Zukov knew he was now a bona fide Coke addict. And with new Coca-Cola plants popping up all over Europe during the war, he had no trouble feeding his habit while he spent months in Western Europe, working with the other leaders to decide the fate of Germany and design the new landscape of European and world politics. Zukov wanted to make sure he could still have his favorite drink when he returned home to Russia, but there was one small problem. They knew that there was no way that the Soviet regime would allow him to bring Coca-Cola, the very embodiment of American capitalist ideals, into his communist home country. This may have been the pre-Cold War era, but relations between the US and the USSR were far from warm. There was already tension between the capitalist US and the communist Soviet Union as each country sought to emerge from World War II as the dominant world superpower and spread their values and politics across the globe. The Soviet Union's goal was to spread communism around the world, and the capitalist Americans were their greatest foe in this regard. The Soviets saw anything American, including and maybe especially Coca-Cola, as the very embodiment of evil capitalist values. They would never allow Coca-Cola to sell their products in the Soviet Union, and they certainly couldn't let a high-ranking and extremely popular war hero to be seen promoting capitalist values by drinking Coca-Cola. Zukov was all too aware of how dangerous it could be for him to bring Coca-Cola home to Russia, but he wasn't ready to give up on his new favorite drink just yet. Zukov was determined to build a stockpile of Coca-Cola to feed his new addiction once he returned to the Soviet Union. Zukov decided to take advantage of the US's apparent desire to keep on good terms with the Soviets to help him secure a supply of Coca-Cola before he returned home. Legend has it that Zukov approached US President Harry Truman himself about his predicament and that Truman agreed to help the Soviet general get his hands on some coke. Whether or not President Truman was really involved, Zukov's wishes became known to General Mark W. Clark, the US's commander in Austria in 1946. In his book For God, Country, and Coca-Cola, author Mark Pendergrast claims that General Clark acted as Zukov's go-between with the Coca-Cola company and was the one to pass along Zukov's specific and rather strange demands. Zukov knew that even being seen with a bottle of caramel-colored Coca-Cola or even just being caught with the distinctive Coke bottle could be disastrous for him. The Soviet elite had destroyed men's careers and ruined their lives for much less, and his high-ranking position and recent popularity made him especially vulnerable. Other Soviet elites would be watching him with hawk eyes, searching for any tidbit of information that could be used against him. Still, he was determined to get his fix, and he knew just how to make it happen. Zukov had an idea that would help him bring Coca-Cola into the USSR in disguise, and he asked General Clark to relay his specifications to the Coca-Cola company. Zukov requested that his special batch of Coca-Cola be made a different color and not be put in that funny-looking bottle. The Coca-Cola company jumped into action yet again. This time, one of their chemists played around with their secret formula until he was able to get the same great Coca-Cola taste without the signature caramel coloring. The finished product was clear in color and clear coke was born. 50 cases of the new custom clear coke were produced in Brussels, especially for General Zukov. 
The clear beverage was bottled in specially made, straight-sided bottles since the regular curvy Coke bottles that were designed to fit comfortably in your hand would have been a dead giveaway. The new bottles even came complete with a red Soviet star on the white cap that sealed each bottle. Zukov was thrilled. He knew his plan would work because the new clear beverage looked just like vodka. Although just getting caught with a bottle of Coca-Cola could be grounds for getting you sent to the dreaded gulags, it was perfectly acceptable for high-ranking members of the Soviet regime to drink straight vodka in public at all times of day and night. Zukov would now be able to enjoy his new favorite beverage right under the noses of the Soviet elite. And no one would think twice about it because they would assume he was just drinking vodka like a good Soviet would. The Coca-Cola company did Zukov a solid, but they didn't do it purely out of the goodness of their hearts. In exchange for their troubles, Zukov made sure that Coca-Cola employees and executives could travel freely in Soviet-controlled Austria without dealing with mountains of red tape. And that seemed like a small price to pay for 50 cases of custom-made beverage. Sadly, but not surprising for Soviet Russia, Zukov fell out of favor with the Soviet regime shortly after he returned to Russia following the war. His extraordinary popularity among the Russian people made him a great threat to Stalin, the Soviet leader, and Zukov spent the next several years working obscure regional commands away from the center of power in Moscow. After Stalin's death, he briefly regained some of his old power, being appointed deputy minister and then minister of defense under the new leader, Nikita Khrushchev. But Khrushchev quickly tired of Zukov's constant attempts to make the Soviet army more autonomous, and he was once again relieved of his commands and removed from all party posts. He lived the rest of his life in relative obscurity until Khrushchev fell from power. But at the end of his life, Zukov was awarded the Order of Lenin for his heroic actions during World War II and his lifelong service to the Soviet Union, and he was allowed to publish his autobiography before he died in 1974. Oddly enough, 1973, the year before Zukov died, was the first year that Pepsi was available for purchase in the USSR. Sadly, Zukov wouldn't live to see his favorite Coca-Cola products hit Russian stores in 1985. In 1992, Coca-Cola released its own brand of clear soda called Tab Clear. The product was a huge failure and was pulled in 1994, but insiders claim that this was Coca-Cola's plan all along. During the mid-90s, there was a huge trend toward clear drinks because they communicated a sense of wellness to consumers. Even beer companies were rushing to produce clear versions of their products to capitalize on the craze. Pepsi had introduced their version of a clear soda, Crystal Pepsi, in the early 90s, and Coca-Cola chief marketing officer Sergio Zyman, who had defected from Pepsi years earlier, created Tab Clear in a kamikaze effort to destroy Pepsi. The competing brands of the two products were intended to confuse consumers about health benefits of the clear beverage market, and when Tab Clear inevitably failed, it took down Crystal Pepsi with it, just as Coca-Cola had planned all along. Clearly, clear soda is great for fooling Soviet leaders into thinking one of their heroes is just drinking vodka, but it's not so great for getting the average capitalist consumer to part with their hard-earned money. This video is sponsored by RAID Shadow Legends. Bring a true console-level experience to your phone with RAID. I've been playing RAID for years, and I love the constant updates, and their latest might be my favorite yet. Say hello to the new legendary champion from the High Elves faction, Deliana. Anyone can add her to their roster, even brand new players. But you have to act right now since Raid's currently running a special Deliana Chase event. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and July 28th, and you'll get Deliana for free. And for all the new players, enter promo code MYDELIANA to get 50 XP brews to instantly get her to max level 50, as well as a ton of silver. There's tons of other new stuff in Raid too, like an all-new champion skin for the oversized Hammer Queen herself, Trunda Guilt Mallet. So what are you waiting for? Click my link in the description or scan my QR code to get bonuses worth $30, including a free epic champion Ina, 200,000 silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard. So download Raid now and I'll see you in the game. The Allies are winning in Europe and the end of the war is finally in sight. Suddenly, though, as British and American forces cross the German border, they come face to face with a 1,000 ton beast. The gunner that first spots one of those behemoths thinks he's seeing an optical illusion. He doesn't survive to figure out he's wrong, as the mechanical monster fires its massive cannon and tears his tank in two. What follows is a bloodbath of epic proportions as titanic Nazi war machines tear through the hordes of Allied troops. This is the 1,000-ton German mega-tank, Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata, and there is no stopping it. Luckily, this gigantic tank would never see the light of day. 
It's scary to imagine what would have happened if Hitler and the Nazis had made it work, but the fact that precious resources were needed elsewhere to defend against Allied forces and the sheer magnitude of the project, the Rata was never built. That being said, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata has an incredibly interesting history, especially when you consider how massive the tank was actually supposed to be. It would have been capable of carrying numerous turrets and anti-aircraft guns. Hitler's dream was to make the Rata into a battleship that moved across the land, hence the name Land Cruiser. The main armament was even supposed to come off of an actual battleship, although it would need slight modifications. Being the biggest and heaviest tank ever built came with all sorts of problems, but Hitler was willing to overcome all of them to see this monstrosity of a tank become a reality. It was 1941 when the first ideas for the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata came about. German researchers were given orders to conduct a survey on Soviet heavy tanks and the best way to fight against them. The company that was in charge of the survey was a munitions and weapons company called Krupp. This project ended up being a source of inspiration for Nazi engineers, as it would end up leading to the Panzer VIII Maus super heavy tank being built. This tank was the precursor to the Rata. The man in charge of the study was Edvard Grotta, who was the director of Krupp at the time. Grotta had previously been a special officer in charge of submarine construction for the Nazi party. He used his background in naval construction along with the survey conducted on Soviet tanks to come up with the design for the Landcruiser P-1000 Rata. On June 23, 1942, Edward Grotta met with Adolf Hitler and other high-ranking members of the Nazi party. He was absolutely giddy about the plans for a new superweapon that he held in his hands. He pulled out the concept drawings for the Rata and began spewing out his ideas on how it would work and how it would essentially be a battleship that can move across a war zone destroying every allied force in its path. The land cruiser would be unstoppable, and the enemy would cower at its greatness. Hitler loved the idea and wanted one built as soon as possible, but as Grotta talked more about the tank specifications, other members of the Nazi party became concerned with the amount of resources that would need to be diverted from the production of other vehicles and weapons to complete the project. But as Grotta talked on and on about how powerful the Land Cruiser P-1000 would be, Hitler couldn't help but dream about the look on his enemies' faces as they gazed upon his massive tank. Edward Grotta explained that the main cannon would be a 28cm SKC-34 naval gun turret, which could be taken from a Scharnhorst-class battleship. Originally, this turret had three cannons, but one would be removed to improve stability and allow for more munitions to be stored aboard the Rata. It would also reduce the weight of the already incredibly heavy tank by around 50 tons. The main armament would be fitted onto the main body of the tank using a 360-degree track, which would allow it to turn and fire in any direction. It could shoot both armor-piercing rounds or high-explosive rounds. Since these shells were designed for naval warfare, they could pack a serious punch and would obliterate any tanks, buildings, or enemy soldiers they hit. The Land Cruiser's biggest threat didn't come from Allied tanks but from their aircraft. This led to the future designs of the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata to include a 128mm anti-tank gun, along with eight 20mm Flak 38 anti-aircraft guns on the hull of the tank to deal with airborne attacks. To supplement the main cannons, the tank was also equipped with two 15mm Mauser MG-151-15 autocannons to fire at ground-based targets. The Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata was so huge that its design also included a vehicle bay that could house two BMW R12 motorcycles for scouting missions. Since the Land Cruiser itself would not move very fast, even in the best of terrain, the crew needed to have the ability to scout ahead and see what was coming. Like a naval ship, it would also have an infirmary and self-contained lavatory system on board. The tank would also have bunk rooms for the crew and numerous storage areas for supplies and extra ammunition. Basically, everything the crew would need to live and fight would be on board. The armor across the entire tank would almost be 10 inches thick to protect the humongous investment put into the tank and the crew that was inside. All in all, the armor would weigh around 200 tons. The guns and cannons would add an additional 300 tons to the overall weight of the Rata. Just the shell of the Land Cruiser would be 500 tons, and that was before adding tracks, engines, ammunition, supplies, and crew. The blueprint showed that the Land Cruiser would end up being around 128 feet long from the tip of the naval guns to the back of the tank, 36 feet high and 46 feet wide. With all this weight and the enormous size of the tank, Hitler and his advisors had some questions about how the whole thing would actually move, but Edward Grota had an answer for that as well. The Rata would include six heavy-duty tracks that would help distribute the weight of the tank evenly. They would each be 4 feet wide and 69 feet long. This would allow the Land Cruiser to traverse difficult terrain, which would be key if the tank was ever going to make it to battle. A 1,000-ton tank could easily get stuck in muddy or rocky areas, 
but if the tracks worked according to plan, the Land Cruiser would be able to roll right over anything that stood in its path. However, a main concern for everyone who saw the initial plans of the Rata was that even with the tracks, the weight of the tank would cause the moving fortress to sink deep into even the most solid ground. Wheels were out of the question, as they would need to be so gigantic the whole vehicle would be unstable. Tracks were needed to cross rivers, ditches, and forested areas because they gave the tank better weight distribution and grip on difficult terrain. The clearance from the ground to the underside of the Rata would be about 6.6 feet. This was hypothesized to be tall enough to allow for it to ford most rivers with ease. Since the Land Cruiser was so heavy, it couldn't be loaded onto boats, as its weight would sink both vessels, and there were no bridges large or strong enough for the Rata to travel across. This meant that once the tank was in the field, it would need to be able to navigate any terrain it came across on its own. Now that Grota had sold his design to Hitler, who could barely contain his excitement over the idea, he needed to explain how this moving fortress would actually move. Grota and his team believed that two man V12 Z32 44 24-cylinder marine diesel engines could do the trick. The engines were used to propel U-boats through the oceans, so they would be ideal candidates for the Land Cruiser. Each engine could produce around 8,400 horsepower. The only problem would be that if one of the engines broke, the Land Cruiser was pretty much stuck where it was. This would make the Land Cruiser a sitting duck if Allied forces surrounded it and bombarded the tank from the ground or the air. The other option was to equip the tank with eight Daimler-Benz MB501 20-cylinder marine diesel engines. Each of these engines could produce around 2,000 horsepower, which would provide a little less power than the man engines. However, since there were eight of them, the tank could probably still move even if one or two went offline. It doesn't seem a final decision was ever made on what type of engine would be best for this new Wunderwaffe. Both engine options would require enormous amounts of diesel to move the Rata. It's estimated that the tank would go through a gallon of fuel a minute running at full power, which would only move the Land Cruiser around 25 miles per hour. Considering that Hitler's hopes and dreams hinged on the Rata crushing his enemies across Europe, the tank would require an almost unfathomable amount of diesel to meet his goals. Other tanks and military vehicles were transported long distances by railway, but the Rata was too large to fit through tunnels and there was no train large enough to carry it. At the time the Land Cruiser concept was brought to Adolf Hitler, Germany was already having problems with its supply lines. Getting oil out of the Middle East was becoming harder and harder as Italian forces were falling apart and the British were holding their own in the region. This problem was exasperated by the United States joining the war. The Nazis desperately needed more oil to keep their war machine running, and if the Rata was ever going to become a reality, it'd need a lot more of this vital resource. The decision was made to invade the Soviet Union to try to gain more resources, not so the land cruiser could be built, but so the Nazis could continue fighting the war. This decision would eventually lead to the Nazis' downfall and the end of the war in Europe. Regardless of the type of engines the tank was fitted with, the exhaust system would have been the same. All engines would be provided with snorkels similar to those used on German U-boats. Their connections between the submarine technology and the Land Cruiser were clearly Edward Grote using what he already knew and then transferring it to the weapon of his dreams. The snorkels would be constructed in a way that oxygen could still reach the Rata's engines even when the tank was traveling through deeper waters. The last thing the Nazis would want was their 1,000-ton tank stuck in a river with no power as the entire vessel began to fill up with water. One of the reasons Hitler might have been so open to the idea of the Land Cruiser was because he already loved another giant tank design called the Mouse. The original design was created by Ferdinand Porsche, the same gentleman responsible for creating fast sports cars and the People's Car, better known as Volkswagens. But the Mouse was not a car, it was actually the heaviest fully enclosed tank ever made. It ended up weighing around 200 tons. The Mouse was about 33 and a half feet long, which was twice as long as the Panzer III tank that had brought the Nazis success throughout the war. The Mouse was 12 feet high and had armor thicker than any naval ship at the time. Hitler was adamant that the tank be equipped with a 128mm Pac-44 Krupp Panzerabwehrkanone anti-tank cannon. Later, designs also included a coaxial 75mm gun to the main turret, a 7.92mm MG-34 machine gun atop the turret, and an MG-151 20 20mm anti-aircraft gun to defend the tank. Hitler's dream was to make the Land Cruiser the big brother to the Mouse, which is why it was given the name Rata. The Panzer VIII Mouse had one huge thing going for it that the Rata didn't though, it was actually built. Only two were ever completed, and of the two, only one of them made it to the battlefield before the end of the war. The Mouse and the Rata would have had very similar problems that made these tanks pretty much useless when it came to fighting in a battle. What were the biggest problems for a 1,000-ton tank? As 1943 progressed, the Nazis just couldn't afford to commit the amount of resources and manpower needed to build the Rata. 
Nazi leadership could not justify trying to construct the behemoth of a tank when it would end up being so impractical even if the Fuhrer wanted it to be a reality. Military strategists examined Verata and determined that it could likely have been built, but it would not end up being the dream weapon that Grota and Hitler had imagined. Its 1,000 ton weight meant it would pulverize any roads it drove across. Maybe this wouldn't be a big deal for the Rata itself, but it would make everyone else's lives miserable. Other Germans who used the roads regularly for supply runs or just to move around the country would have had to travel across the jagged remains of concrete that the Rata left behind. As mentioned before, the size and weight of the Rata also meant it wouldn't be able to use bridges or trains, so deploying the tank anywhere quickly wasn't a possibility which is kind of a problem during wartime. The size of the tank would also make it an easy target for Allied bombers. Even though the Rata would be equipped with anti-air guns, there just wouldn't be enough firepower to stop multiple bombers from targeting the tank and managing at least a few direct hits during a run. The Rata's armor was thick, but multiple bombs slamming into the hull at the same time would be enough to at least damage some of its more vital components such as the engines or the tracks. After about a year of planning and crunching the numbers to see if the Land Cruiser Rata could somehow be built, Hitler's Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, finally put an end to the madness. He explained that Nazi Germany was at a crossroads, and they needed to focus their resources on weapons that had already been proven to be effective such as the Panzer IV. However, the craziest part is that Grota and his team at Krupp had already started designing an even bigger tank. They'd taken the idea for the Rata and implemented a new weapon system. The idea was if they could build a 1,000 ton tank, then adding another 500 tons to it couldn't be all that hard. The team designed a second land cruiser and named it the Monster. Instead of using the 28cm SKC-34 naval gun turret, the P-1500 would use a more powerful weapon that Krupp had already designed. The Monster would be fitted with a modified version of the heavy Gustav 80cm railway gun. This was another massive weapon that just wasn't practical. It had been used once at the Siege of Sevastopol, where it took 4,000 men about five weeks to get the gun into firing position. After the heavy Gustav was in position, it required another 500 men to fire it. The siege lasted about a month and the heavy Gustav fired 47 rounds. The problem was that it had worn out its original barrel. The massive cannon needed to be shipped back to the Krupp factory in Germany to be refitted with a new barrel. This would be the only time the heavy Gustav would see battle as the massive cannon was impractical and abandoned by the Nazi military. It was dismantled, and its pieces spread throughout the factory to keep the incoming Soviets from using the Nazis' own gigantic cannon against them. Yet, the planners of the monster didn't see the heavy Gustav as just a useless cannon. They were convinced that by incorporating the heavy Gustav onto the Land Cruiser P-1500 monster, all the problems with the original weapon could be solved. It would be more versatile and could travel wherever it was needed without the necessity of train tracks. Obviously, it would be incredibly slow and an easy target, but that didn't seem to concern Nazi engineers when they were designing the Wunderwaffe for the Führer. However, Speer would have none of it. When Hitler was preoccupied with news of his forces being defeated across Europe, Speer cancelled all projects related to the Land Cruiser, as well as the construction of any more Maus tanks. Unlike others in the Nazi party, he wasn't captivated by the dreams of gigantic weapons that may or may not have been practical. He was focused on building tanks and weapons that could possibly turn the war back in the Nazis' favor. Luckily, no matter what Speer did, the Nazis had already made too many mistakes and would not be able to recover. There is one terrifying thought, though, that we want to leave you with. What if Edward Grote had come up with the idea of the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata earlier? Could it have affected the outcome of the war? This huge tank would most certainly be a formidable machine to go up against in battle, but perhaps it would have been an even more dangerous psychological impact. The heavy Gustav was originally supposed to be constructed to aid in the demolition of French fortifications when the Nazis' invasion commenced. However, the Nazis found that capturing France was easier than they anticipated, and the invasion was complete before the heavy Gustav was in its testing phase. Likewise, World War II had been raging for a few years before the Rata was brought to Hitler's attention, which did not allow enough time for him to ever see this nightmare of a tank become reality. But what if those superweapons had been built before the start of World War II? The date is September 1, 1939. Adolf Hitler did the unthinkable and invaded Poland. The rest of Europe braces for what will inevitably be an all-out war. As reconnaissance planes fly over the borders of Germany, they spot gigantic moving structures from the sky. The crew notes that they didn't even need binoculars to spot these monstrosities, as they were so large that they could be seen from cruising altitude. What the Allied recon pilots have witnessed is a platoon of Land Cruiser P-1000 Ratas moving toward the French border. In this unthinkable imaginary scenario, the idea for the Land Cruiser was developed right when Hitler came to power, and its construction started almost immediately. 
The massive tanks are slow moving, but it seems as if nothing can stand in their way. France quickly falls with minimal casualties to Nazi forces. With the land cruisers on the battlefield, German forces move from town to town and decimate any resistance by rolling the Ratas right into the middle of the fight. Nazi soldiers wait patiently in the bellies of the beasts until the battle is over, and then enter French towns and cities to round up anyone who's left alive. Germany begins fighting land battles as if they were naval battles. They deploy their land cruisers across Europe with panzer tanks as support. When Allied forces try to reach the mainland on D-Day, they're greeted by a land cruiser P-1000 Rata on the beach of Normandy. Their bullets do nothing to its thick armor, and the main cannons are able to fire at the ships that sit offshore, causing them to retreat. In the Soviet Union, the Rata platoons are slowly making progress through the harsh Russian landscape. Luckily for the Nazis, the moving fortresses keep them warm during the brutal Soviet winters. They begun capturing oil wells as they progress deeper into Soviet territory to keep the diesel engines running. It's not a pleasant experience living for months inside of a Rata, but it is doable. As the winter gives way to spring, the land cruisers move forward and capture more land. By having dozens of Land Cruiser P-1000 Ratas at their disposal, the Nazis have been able to establish footholds in the region that they would have not been able to otherwise. Once a Land Cruiser is deployed and is set up in a defensive position, it's almost impossible to destroy. As Allied forces focus on trying to eliminate these huge deadly targets, the German Air Force and infantry launch counteroffensives. In a worst-case scenario, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata would serve as a powerful distraction. With Allied forces tied up trying to destroy these monstrous tanks, the Nazis can devote more forces to secure resources and fuel for their war machine. The Allies are focusing too heavily on trying to build their own gigantic tanks or finding ways to defeat the Nazi land cruisers, and they leave themselves vulnerable. Nazi aircraft and soldiers invade Allied countries while their attention is focused elsewhere. The Nazis now control all of Europe, and World War II ends much differently. This scenario could also go a very different way if Germany started building dozens of Land Cruiser P-1000 Rathas before World War II. The Nazis pour resources into the Land Cruisers only to find they break down constantly and get stuck every few miles. In this case, World War II might have come to a quicker end, as the Nazis would have depleted their resources early on by building completely useless 1,000-ton tanks. There's no denying that if the Nazis had been able to build a Land Cruiser, it would have taken a psychological toll on any Allied soldier who looked upon it. The 1,000-ton tank would have been a terrifying sight to behold. If one of those fortresses was able to move across Europe, the Allies likely would have devoted huge amounts of men and resources to try to stop it. If nothing else, the Rata would be able to cause massive amounts of destruction and fear until Allied forces dealt with it or it broke down under its own weight. There are some historians who believe that the design for the Land Cruiser Rata didn't even make it to Hitler's office. Most think that he asked for a feasibility study for a 1,000-ton tank in 1942, but the design for the Rata is just a fabrication. It could have been a hoax or an engineer's dream tank that he concocted for his own amusement. Currently, there can be arguments made for both sides. Adolf Hitler was a nut job, who most definitely wanted a 1,000-ton tank, but it's not clear how far the plans actually got. Edward Grota and the Krupp company built some pretty insane vehicles and weapons. We also know there were a number of other Wunderwaffe that Hitler planned on building once he secured the resources to do so. It seems likely he would have wanted the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata to be one of them. Right now, we can only speculate on how a massive Land Cruiser would have affected the outcome of World War II. Maybe the Rata would have turned the tide of the war back in Germany's favor, or perhaps if the tank was built, it would have caused so much destruction to the roads as it drove across Nazi infrastructure that it would have had to expedite their downfall. Either way, the thought of a thousand-ton tank in the hands of Adolf Hitler is a terrifying one. Ah, the ancient world. Home of humble huts, stone tools, and giant sculptures? Running water? Computers? What's going on here? Turns out our ancestors knew a lot more than we thought. Here are 20 of the most amazing ancient inventions and designs that baffled scientists. Number 20. The Cognostone It was 1887 when the Reverend James Harvey was exploring West Dunbartonshire in Scotland. He dug through the dirt near the Cogno farm and struck something hard. It must have been a rock, except that this rock was larger than expected. He kept digging to unearth the annoying object and discovered that it measured a massive 42 by 26 feet. What's more, it wasn't just a random boulder. It was a stone slab that had been placed there deliberately, and it was covered with carved indentations known as cup and ring art, one of the oldest forms of art ever discovered. What was the purpose of the Konkno stone? Soon, archaeologists from around the world wanted a chance to look at it. This simple form of art is done by gently chipping away at the rock surface and has been found around the world, but the Konkno stone is probably the most complete and largest example found. 
It's been nicknamed the Druid Stone and is believed to have religious significance. But if people wanted to continue unlocking its secrets, they'd have to take some special measures. Fears of vandalism led to it being covered up again in 1965, and it was only reopened for further study in 2015. The Konkno Stone might be a mystery, but other ancient inventions were much more useful. Number 19. Damascus Steel in the 13th century, if you wanted the deadliest weapons around, you didn't head to Europe. You headed to the Near East, where the swords being forged were those of legend. Made from specialized wood steel, which was known for its high carbon content, the blades known as Damascus steel were forged by master smiths into sharp, shatter-resistant blades that could be trusted to lead you into victory in battle. The blades found today are still in remarkably good condition and have been studied extensively by archaeologists. So why aren't they still made today? Because at some point the technique used to make these blades was lost. While the blades were reputed to be the best in the world, they were painstaking to make, both the process of creating the steel and forging the blade. Production of the blades with these unique spiral patterns faded and was all but extinct by 1900, and the weapons market then shifted to mass-producing cheaper weapons for higher volume wars. You might see someone try to pass off their blade as authentic Damascus steel to weapons fans, but the odds are you're getting a factory-made knockoff instead. But some inventions are just puzzling. Number 18. The Roman Dodecahedron it was 1739 when an archaeologist found the first of the weird objects, a copper item with 12 flat faces in a geometric shape, with each side punctured with a hole and the corners being marked by a bulb-like knob. It seemed like a curiosity with no real purpose, until another one showed up in a dig in a completely different country. In the almost 300 years since, archaeologists have dug up more than a hundred near-identical dodecahedrons scattered around Europe from Wales to Hungary, which led them all to one pressing question. What the heck are these things? While they were not likely crafted by the same person, the design of the devices is highly similar, and they've been traced back to the Roman Empire, which was present in all these countries, but no reference to them has been found in literature, and scientists are still at a loss of what they were used for, if anything. Some theories include dice for games of chance, measuring devices for grain or coins, gauges for water pipes. But maybe the best guess would be that they were candle holders. Traces of wax were found in some samples, but maybe they were just curiosities and the Romans were re-gifting them all around the empire. Personally, we think that the Romans invented Dungeons and Dragons almost 2,000 years ago. It wasn't the only Roman invention that seemed to be more about form over function. Number 17. The Lycurgus Cup it's the perfect conversation piece, a stained glass cup that casts a distant shade over anything you're drinking. But wait, it was just red a minute ago. How did it switch to green? No, this isn't another one of those weird things like the dress that everyone saw as different colors. It's the Lycurgus Cup. It might sound like a magical chalice from a book about boy wizards. This 4th century Roman curiosity is the only complete one of its kind, and it's one of the earliest examples available of dichronic glass. So how does it work exactly? The trick is simple. When it's lit from behind, the glass appears red. When it's lit from the front, it appears green. The way it does this might be the first example of nanotechnology in history. Tiny particles of gold and silver are hidden in the glass, and that affects the shading of the glass depending on the light conditions. The exact process isn't fully understood by scientists, but they might be too busy staring at the pretty colors and the embossed design of the mythical king Lycurgus and his war against the gods. One thing's for sure, whoever the Roman was who owned this, he was probably a hit at dinner parties. But to the far north, another ancient group was cracking a great mystery. Number 16. The Vague Vizier Today's compasses are mechanical devices, as simple as pointing them in the right direction and getting a picture of where you're going. But hundreds of years earlier in the frozen north, a different system might have been used. It might look like a collection of strange symbols arranged on eight points, but it was actually an Icelandic compass known as the Vejvisir. This device used eight rune staves that were believed to be magic in the Icelandic faiths and was found documented hundreds of years later in their manuscripts. But was this compass pointing to something else entirely? The Vejvisir used eight runes, each pointing in a specific direction, which had happened to be the eight cardinal and intercardinal directions. This would make for a makeshift compass that would let the sun point the ship's way. The exact process of navigating with this ancient device is unknown, but is believed to be one of the earliest methods of navigation among European explorers, and it was also believed to serve as a symbol of protection by its users. Hey, if it keeps them out of storms and heading in the right direction, it might be. But some inventions are even more ahead of their time. Number 15. The Greek Dora during the 1st century CE in Greece, technology wasn't all that 
that advanced, except in one building in Alexandria. The engineer Heron developed a unique system for the temple door to open and close the doors automatically, not too much different from the sliding doors that operate at your local convenience store. But while the design was similar on the surface, they were very different in a lot of other ways. For one thing, they didn't slide open at the drop of a hat, in fact, they took several hours to open fully, making them more of a ceremonial flourish. But that doesn't mean the technology wasn't impressive. It started by placing a brass pot suspended under a ceremonial fire, filled halfway with water. When the fire was lit, the air inside the brass pot would expand and send the water flowing into the containers below. These containers would then drag the pulley ropes that would slowly open the doors. It was an impressive display of the scientists' innovation, and Heron apparently also built a set for the city gates. It's not clear how useful they would have been, but if you were in ancient Greece sitting around and watching the magic gates open, it might have been a nice change of pace. Across the world, one invention was the most impressive for how large it was. Number 14. The Nazca Lines The Nazca Desert in southern Peru is a massive landscape. If you walk along it, you might notice some odd lines in the desert. Probably doesn't look like much, something that easily could have been carved by a plow. But if you get higher, touring the area in a plane, you'll see that these aren't random lines at all. They're carefully carved designs, painting a picture through making depressions in the desert floor. By removing layers, this changes the color of the dirt on the surface and turns the entire desert desert floor into a canvas. Even more impressive, this massive art project is over 2,000 years old. Whatever the ancient project was, the Nazca lines are far from simple. While some are basic geometric shapes, this UNESCO World Heritage Site is filled with recognizable designs, including plants and animals like spiders, fish, birds, monkeys, and even a human. Many scientists have tried to figure out the purpose of these unique lines, and the most common theory is that they're religious symbols that might be able to be seen by the gods of the Nazca people, although other scientists have theorized that they might be linked to constant installations. Seeing them from a plane is a popular experience, although the fragile sites are increasingly secure to protect them on the ground. But not all ancient inventions and creations are stunning. Some look a lot like ours. Number 13. The Nimrud Lens How many times do we use lenses in our modern day life? You might use a magnifying glass or a microscope to get a close-up view. You might have a pair of glasses on you right now. These curved glass structures bend light in a way that can assist how we see the world. But this technology might be a lot older than most people know. In 1850, English archaeologist Austin Henry Lanyard was exploring the palace of Nimrud in what was once Assyria and found a stunning item in modern-day Iraq. It was a carved piece of rock crystal, polished fine and in surprisingly good condition, and it looked a lot like a modern lens, and its purpose might have been the same. While the lens wasn't as cleanly polished as modern-day glass lenses, it had an oval shape and the design indicated it might have been used to focus sunlight. While it might have been used as a magnifying glass, the design could have also been used to start fires easily when it concentrates sunlight on a flammable surface, something every kid who decided to create an anthill apocalypse knows about. The lens is almost 3,000 years old, and today it's on display at the British Museum, so curious onlookers can investigate, often through their own glasses. It's not the only item stunning archaeologists for how long it lasted. Number 12. The Iron Pillar of Delhi It's far from the most impressive item on the list, an iron pillar around 23 feet tall with a bell pattern on the top. At more than 3 tons, it's impressive that it was erected, but far from the biggest monument out there. But what stands out about it isn't its design, it's that it's still standing at all. Because this iron pillar was erected by the powerful Gupta Emperor Chandragupta II over 1600 years ago, and looks today like it might have looked back then, having not degraded or rusted in more than a millennia and a half since. So what's this iron pillar's beauty secret? Scientists around the world have studied it for its anti-corrosion capabilities, and construction experts would love to recreate it. The key seems to be a layer of crystalline iron hydrogen phosphate forming on top of the main iron base, which has an unusually high level of phosphorus. It's kept it from degrading even in the intense deadly heat and humidity, and means the complex series of inscriptions all over it can still be read clearly even today. Today's iron doesn't last nearly as long before rusting, and the pillar stands as a testimony to the skill of the metal workers of ancient India. But some ancient inventions might not have any use at all. Number 11. The Voynich Manuscript Wilfred Voynich was a Polish book dealer, most known for his massive emporium of rare books, but one book he purchased in 1912 would create a centuries-long mystery. It was an old manuscript, clearly several hundred years old from the material used, but it was about all anyone could figure out about it. The writing was gibberish. It was filled with colorful images, but few of them seemed to make sense. Some drawings were of people, others were of astrological symbols, and others seemed to be of plants that didn't exist. It would take the best linguists in the world to try to crack this case. And over a hundred 
hundred years later, the book known as the Voynich Manuscript remains a complete mystery. Carbon dated to the early 15th century is written in a language that doesn't seem to exist and has been passed among the best codebreakers in the world. Some think it represents a lost language or society, others think it might be a highly effective code, and others think one medieval prankster might have pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes in human history. Whatever the answer is, it's locked up deep within the book's bizarre script, which now sits on display at Yale University for amateur codebreakers to stare at. Hey, keep moving! Sometimes inventing for inventing's sake is its own achievement. Number 10. The Eola Pile Machines during the time of ancient Greece were few and far between, but that didn't stop Hero of Alexandria. The Greek-Egyptian engineer managed to create a unique device named a Hero's Engine, which functioned as an early steam turbine. A spherical vessel with bent nozzles on each side, it rotates on its axis. But when steam is pumped into it, something amazing happens. The gas comes out of the nozzles after being pumped into it from a boiler below, and the turbine begins to spin from the pressure of the steam. Which raises the question, what was it actually used for? The device has something in common with much larger wind and steam turbines, but this one was too small to provide any meaningful amount of power. Some speculate that it could have been used to predict the weather based on the direction it was spinning, but that doesn't factor into the steam-powered element. The most likely solution might be that Hero of Alexandria just thought it was a pretty cool idea and wanted to show off his invention. After all, there wasn't any Netflix to talk about around ancient Greek water coolers. But the most ancient inventions were created out of a pressing need. Number 9. The Desert Kite Hunting in ancient times wasn't easy. You either tracked down small game and it took a lot of rabbits to fill the pot, or you took a chance at hunting big game. Ancient hunters would try to herd mammoths off cliffs, but all it took was one wrong move and the big game was bolting into the woods, or worse, turning around and trampling all over you. But scientists now believe that as much as 7,000 years ago some clever hunters might have found a way to tilt the playing field in their favor. Enter Desert Kites, a deadly trap for capturing live game. But these animals aren't being lured with colorful flying objects. The hunters would build large walls of stone that would lure the animals through a narrow neck that would lead them into a depression that they would be unable to escape from. The hunters would then descend, kill the animals from afar with arrows, or get the drop on them to slaughter them. So why kites? Because when seen from the air, the shape of the traps sometimes resemble kites with long tails. While the traps fell out of favor due to their labor-intensive nature and the development of better weaponry, they remain an early reminder that when humans want to eat, they'll find a way to get their meat. More and more scientists are discovering evidence that humanity was more advanced earlier than expected. Number 8. Gobekli Tepe what was humanity like between 10 and 12,000 years ago? Evidence is minimal because few remnants of civilizations have been found. What has been discovered is mostly rudimentary weapons and cave art pointing to a nomadic and subsistence-based society until recently. In 1963, scientists noted an unusual site in what's now Anatolia, Turkey. It was mostly ignored until 1995 when German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt began excavating it. And what he found was amazing, a detailed building dated to at least 8,000 BCE. And what it might have been used for is even more stunning. The site, known as the Gobekli Tepe, was a massive complex atop a mountain. If found in a more modern city, it would likely be a central meeting place, but there was no evidence of agriculture or civilization around it. This has made many scientists, including Schmidt, theorize that it might have been a meeting place for representatives of different nomadic tribes. While it's unlikely to have served any government function, it's entirely possible that they worshipped the same deity and might have used this location to pray or leave offerings for success in hunting and gathering, which would make these ruins the site of the world's first temple. It it wasn't the only time scientists were amazed at how early things were figured out. Number 7. Zheng Hong Seismoscope Zheng Hong was widely known as the best scientist of the Han Dynasty, essentially being China's Leonardo da Vinci more than a thousand years before there was a Leonardo da Vinci. He was a jack of all trades, and one of his specialties was understanding the Earth's forces, particularly destructive ones. Earthquakes were a concern to the emperor, and Zheng Hong believed they could be understood better. No one knew the forces that created them, but Zheng Hong created a device that could at least start tracking how they worked. And it wasn't just a brilliant invention, it looked cool too. Believed to be the first seismoscope ever built, it was a bronze urn-like object that had a swinging pendulum within. When an earthquake could be detected, the device dropped a bronze ball into one of eight tubes shaped like a dragon's mouth, which then rolled into a toad-shaped holder. This would indicate the general direction of the earthquake, and sure enough, a messenger would usually come in a few days and report the earthquake from the direction Zheng Hong's device predicted. The seismoscope didn't survive the 2,000 years since, but replicas have been made, although none are quite as reliable as the literature describes the original. This next invention was no doubt very welcome. Number 6. The Indus Valley Sanitation System Ah, indoor plumbing. Without it, things would get pretty stinky. 
It's a modern invention that everyone's happy about, or is it? Surprisingly, the Indus Valley civilization in what's now Pakistan and northern India had a water supply and sanitation system that surprised archaeologists with just how much it looks like ours. And it existed at least 4,000 years ago in the Bronze Age. To start with, the structures of the cities made from mud and clay included both public and private baths so people could get clean and take care of their business. But it's what happened next that's most impressive. Underneath the cities was a complex series of underground drains that disposed of sewage and kept the well water clean. Many houses had their own private drains that would funnel waste to a larger drain and keep it from contaminating the city at large. If that sounds a lot like a city sewer system, it's because it is. But those are created by complex metal structures today, which make it all the more impressive that cities like Mohenjo-Daro managed to build a similar system using nothing but bricks and terracotta. Number 5. Saxe Huaman Before the arrival of European conquerors spelled the end of the civilizations, the Americas were dominated by three powerful empires, the Maya, the Aztecs, and the Inca of Peru. All left impressive legacies, but one feat on the outskirts of Cusco left archaeologists particularly stunned. It was a massive citadel dating back over a thousand years, but the most interesting feature was built in the 15th century. It was a wall, but not just any wall. It showed some of the most advanced construction techniques in the world at the time. Archaeologists were stunned at how well formed the wall was, without an inch of space to allow for structural issues. However, the wall wasn't made with any binding objects to hold the large stones together. Rather, the individual stones had been carefully carved to match up against each other and form an interlocking design that kept the wall steady. All the more impressive given that the Peruvian site is located 12,000 feet above sea level. It's no wonder it's been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the governments determined that nothing threatened the wall after standing tall for hundreds of years. Some items remain a mystery. Number 4. The Baghdad Batteries Yeah, batteries. Not only are they indispensable for flashlights when you're camping, but they made your favorite toy robot go as a kid. But they're modern inventions, or are they? It's one of the biggest mysteries in archaeology, and it all started when they were unearthed from modern-day Iraq in the 1930s. They were three separate objects, a ceramic pot, a copper tube, and an iron rod. On their own, they didn't seem like much, but they fit together seamlessly and seemed to hint at a device far ahead of its time. Was it truly the world's first battery? Some scientists say yes. Wilhelm Koenig worked at the Iraq Museum in the 1930s and speculated that these three objects might have worked together to form a galvanic cell that would be able to electroplate objects. While this was seen as far-fetched, other tests showed that an acidic element was present in the jar, which meant it could have been an electrolyte solution that would help to generate a current. Skeptics, however, say there's no way to make an electric connection from the device, and the ceramic pot might have just been a simple storage device. But no one can quite explain the other components yet, and the Baghdad batteries still generate experiments to try to prove their electric nature, but one invention precluded the age of fire. Number 3. Greek Fire Fire in the hole! Today, warfare is commonly associated with high-intensity explosives. However, thousands of years ago, it was more likely to be fought with swords and arrows. That is, at least until the time of the Eastern Roman Empire. It was the 7th century when enemy ships first came across the Roman ships and gasped in horror as they unleashed a flamethrower. The Romans would deploy a tube and it would not only shoot powerful flames, but the fire would spread on the water and send the enemy's wooden ships to the bottom of the sea. What was the secret of this deadly weapon? While incendiary weapons were used before the invention of Greek fire, they were mostly passive and had to be ignited. Greek fire was unique because it was designed to be fired directly. What was in this deadly cocktail? The exact recipe is lost, but a partial description involves sulfur and flammable resin. But as deadly as this weapon is, it had its weaknesses. Arrows and bullets only go in one direction, but once fire is unleashed, it often acts like it has a mind of its own. And that means that a Greek fire might have claimed some of the very ships that it was fired from. Sometimes it's not the what, but the how. Number 2. Stonehenge It's one of the most stunning sights in the world. Stonehenge, a massive prehistoric monument in England. The giant stone arches in a circle are incredibly recognizable and are believed to be a religious site. Built by a civilization of monument builders at least 4,000 years ago and maybe more, they are highly protected by damage from tourists, but that doesn't keep countless people from getting as close as they can to stare at the giant arches, and there's a good chance many of them are thinking this exact same thing. How in the heck was this built? Stonehenge isn't one of the most complex designs on this list. Every arch is three large stones, but in an era without machines, how were the massive stones, each weighing several tons, arranged so effectively? The culture left no written records, leading many to wonder if they used magic to levitate them into place, to which scientists say, not likely. Instead, they point to Neolithic technology for elaborate sleds and pulleys that could have made it possible for large groups to lift the stones. The truth isn't fully known, nor is the purpose of the site, which continues to spawn wild theories to this day. 
but one ancient invention puzzled scientists more than any other. Number 1. The Antikythera Mechanism The year was 1900 and Captain Dimitrios Kontos was on a mission with his crew of divers to collect sponges. Along the way, they pulled up interesting Greek historical objects from the depths, including statues and pottery. But no one was prepared for the massive object they discovered at the bottom of the sea, an ancient rusted clockwork device that seemed to be part of a complex machine. It looked like something out of science fiction or a steampunk future, but dating indicated it was around 2,000 years old. Had Kontos and his crew discovered one of history's biggest secrets? The machine had obviously degraded and was brought up in parts, so scientists can't be sure that they're getting the full picture. However, most agree on one thing. The object, named the Antikythera Mechanism, might be the first computer ever built. An analog device, it seems to be designed to calculate the location of the stars and predict lunar and solar eclipses. It also seems to only have time tracking function that would let users know when the four-year cycle of the early Olympics was coming around. However, the machine's remnants are made up of 82 distinct fragments with gears and inscriptions and no one's sure exactly how it all fits together. Although models have been made, but one thing's for sure, the ancient Greeks were working with machines far more complicated than anyone imagined. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. It's the height of the Cold War and 300 meters beneath the surface of the stormy North Atlantic, a Soviet submarine steams past the Icelandic coast. The Soviet captain looks to his crew. Everyone is holding their breath, waiting to find out if they've slipped past the formidable NATO anti-submarine picket line that stretches from Iceland to mainland Europe. After several tense minutes of silence, the crew relaxes. Sonar can hear NATO patrol ships far away, but not a single one of them has changed course. They haven't been detected. Ordering his men to hold bearing, the captain plots a course a few hundred miles from the American coastline, where his nuclear ballistic missile submarine will loiter undetected, ready to deliver a devastating surprise nuclear attack in case of war. This is how the balance of power between the two great superpowers is kept. Neither side is able to completely eliminate the other's nuclear arsenal completely without being destroyed in kind. Settling in for a long three-month patrol, the Soviet crew breathes a sigh of relief, knowing they successfully fooled NATO's anti-submarine patrols. Yet unknown to the Soviet sub, a predator stalks the deep cold of the Atlantic, just a few hundred meters behind them. A 370-foot beast made of high-tech steel and aluminum, manned by the US Navy's finest soldiers. The Russians are good submariners, but their subs lack sophistication, and unbeknownst to them, a powerful American underwater weapon can detect them from clear across the Atlantic, zeroing in the US Navy's hunter-killer subs onto their location. For decades, Soviet nuclear attack submarines believe that they're prowling the oceans of the world undetected, completely unaware of the hidden killers always following their every move. If a nuclear war ever broke out, the Soviet ballistic missile submarine fleet would never get a chance to join the war. Eliminated in minutes by the hidden assassins keyed onto their locations by an incredible piece of American technology, the Sound Surveillance System, or SOSIS. Very rudimentary passive and active sonar systems existed as far back as World War I, but these early systems could only manage detection at distances of a few thousand yards, and even then only under the most favorable conditions. During World War II, sonar technology barely moved past these rudimentary systems, and much anti-submarine surveillance was based on visually identifying the vessels by air as they loitered near the surface to recharge their batteries or bring up their periscopes to target ships. During the 1920s, though, the development of the sonic depth finder was an important first step in developing more advanced and capable sonar systems. Although the various elements of a modern sonar system would not achieve technological maturity or be truly understood until halfway through the Second World War. In 1937, Lay University scientist Maurice Ewing made a critical discovery which would catapult American sonar technology far ahead of its competitors. While doing seismic refraction experiments in water three miles deep in the North Atlantic, Ewing used explosive charges placed at different depths to generate sound waves. As Ewing listened to the echoes of the explosions, he discovered that sound signals at very low frequencies could travel great distances with minimal loss, and he postulated that in certain conditions, so-called deep sound channels 
could exist which would propagate an acoustic signal for hundreds or even thousands of miles. At the same time, the invention and refinement of the Bathy Thermograph by scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution made possible for the first time the continuous measurement of ocean temperature at various depths, and more importantly how fast the speed of sound varies at different distances below the waves. A growing understanding of how underwater sounds are refracted or bent by variations in the sound's velocity caused by different temperatures and depths helped support Ewing's hypothesis that underwater channels could indeed propagate acoustic signals for as much as thousands of miles. Wasting no time, the Navy immediately authorized a slew of tests for developing these deep sound channels for military use, although at first they would only be used for communications. During the spring of 1944, Ewing supervised a test using the USS Buckley, which steamed away from a receiving ship, dropping explosive charges set to blow at various depths. By determining the pattern of explosions and the depths they occurred at, the Navy hoped to build a system of communication that was impossible to jam, and only required a receiving ship to have nothing more than a basic hydrophone. The explosions from the Buckley were clearly discernible until at last the Buckley had to call off the test after reaching a distance of 900 miles and still being clearly heard by the receiving ship. The test was a huge success, and a system for helping locate and rescue downed pilots was immediately developed. Named so far for sound fixing and ranging, the rescue system consisted of nothing more than a downed pilot dropping a small explosive charge down to the depths of the deep sound channel, where an underwater system of hydrophones would pick up the explosions and triangulate the pilot's exact location. Too late in the war to be of great effect, the rescue signaling system was nevertheless a huge success, but some minds in the US military slowly began to see an altogether different potential to this quirk of underwater acoustics. After World War II's end, the US Navy continued to establish major SOFAR networks in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, investing in the future security of its downed pilots in case of another major war. Yet as the first chills of the Cold War began to grip the world, the growing threat of a Soviet submarine fleet based on capture German designs urged Navy leadership to develop a more formidable anti-submarine warfare capability based on the detection of underwater sound. By the early 1950s, the US government believed that Soviet submarines posed the greatest threat to American security over any other Soviet weapon, and thus established Project Hartwell. For six months, the best and brightest minds of the American Navy and civilian scientists alike drew together to discuss how to counter the Soviet submarine threat. Long-range submarine detection was premier in the list of topics discussed during Project Hartwell, and a focus of its efforts. The physicist Frederick Hunt electrified the project heads with a stunning and very very convincing idea. Why not use so far to detect Soviet subs? He showed Project Hartwell's leadership that higher frequency sounds made by Soviet subs could be easily detected at ranges of a few hundred miles, but frequencies below 500 hertz would easily penetrate through the various layers of the oceans to reach the deep sound channel from virtually any depth and thus make detection of a noisy Soviet sub possible at ranges of thousands of miles. The US Navy immediately started several highly secret research programs to better understand long-range sound transmission through the ocean. They even partnered with AT&T to begin building underwater listening stations. This budding secret surveillance network was classified with the acronym SOSUS, standing for Sound Surveillance System, and received a top secret classification. In January 1952, the first prototype SOSUS installation was deployed by a British cable layer, and after a series of successful detection trials with US submarines, the Navy approved the installation of more arrays along the entire American East Coast. Two years later, a system would extend to the West Coast and to Hawaii as well, ensuring that no hostile sub could approach the US mainland without being detected. The early SOSIS arrays were fixed directly to the seafloor at specific locations that could access the deep sound channel and oriented at right angles to the expected approach axis of a hostile submarine. The outputs of each hydrophone was transmitted to shore processing stations through multicolor armored cables. At these shore-based processing stations, the incoming data was analyzed and observers would look for the distant frequencies given off by rotating machinery. Hundreds of printers at these facilities would output infographs 24 hours a day, constantly monitoring the entire ocean for Soviet signals. Observers would look for distinctive submarine signatures printed on the graphs, and if simultaneous contacts were made with multiple arrays, then a target could be verified and its position triangulated. Moments later, a US sub or surface boat would then be dispatched. SOSIS had originally been designed to detect air-breathing Soviet diesel submarines, 
which would have to surface to snorkel depths to run their diesel engines and recharge their batteries. However, the system's ability to cover a wide range of frequencies at nearly any depth would prove even more effective at tracking deep-diving Soviet nuclear-powered submarines. With the first SOSIS contact on a Soviet nuclear boat west of Norway established in 1962, SOSIS would go on to play a major role during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it detected three Soviet submarines leaving Russian waters heading for Cuba. In 1968, SOSIS made its first detections of Soviet Charlie and Victor-class submarines, proving its worth even against upgraded Soviet designs. It even allowed for the discovery and secret retrieval years later of a Soviet Gulf-class submarine that had sunk north of Hawaii. The US Navy had a silver bullet in its arsenal, and with it the ability to completely shut down the threat of Soviet submarines. Yet the secret of SOSIS wouldn't last. In late 1967, US Navy Chief Warrant Officer John Anthony Walker strolled into the Soviet Embassy in Washington and sold a top-secret radio cipher card for a few thousand dollars. His treachery directly led to the North Korean attack on the USS Pueblo while in international waters, an act which was later revealed to have been coordinated by the Soviets, who wanted access to the encryption devices stored aboard so that they could make full use of John Walker's leaked intelligence. Aboard the Pueblo, though, the Soviets discovered some details about SOSUS, and through subsequent spying soon discovered the fact that their submarines had been tracked almost effortlessly for two decades. Immediately after the John Walker betrayal, Soviet submarine designs became much quieter and thus harder to detect. SOSUS continued to operate, however, until the end of the Cold War, and in 1993, with the threat of Soviet submarines nothing more than a memory, the system was turned over to civilian researchers who adopted it for studying whale migrations and communication. In 1996, SOSUS's big brother, the Advanced Deployable System, became operational. This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. We've all had ideas that we think can make us millionaires. Those light bulb moments when you dream up an invention that no one else has yet imagined. In truth, very few ideas prove to be successful, and for every new creation that turns out to be a big hit, there are countless others that fail spectacularly. But amongst the failures are some incredibly simple and often unconventional ideas that have made their developers hugely wealthy, and sometimes for very little effort. Which are the best of the best? That's what we'll be looking at today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, Unlikely Inventions That Made Millions. We've researched some of the craziest ideas that made people richer than they could have imagined. Some of these inventions are weird, wacky, or simply did well because of the fun factor, and others turned out to address a real need. But what they all have in common is they hit the top of the sales list, as customers couldn't get enough of them. We filtered what we think are the most interesting ones worth talking about to bring you our top 10 list. Let's jump straight in and take a look. Number 10, Roni and Ken D. Lulo knew something wasn't right when their dog Midnight kept missing the frisbee during a game of fetch. In 1997, during a visit to their local dog park in San Jose, California, the couple noticed that their pooch was squinting. He seemed to be sensitive to sunlight, Roni recalls, and so was born an idea for doggy shades, goggle-style sunglasses that they named Doggles. Initially, Roni used a pair of sports goggles and altered them to fit the Border Collie. Midnight's frisbee performance improved and he became the talk of the dog park. Roni created a website to showcase photos of the pooch modeling his eyewear. People love to see a dog wearing glasses, she says. To her surprise, people started contacting Roni, asking if they could purchase a pair of these cool doggy shades, which led her and her husband to explore manufacturing. And doggles do more than protect your pet from the sun's glare, they also keep out dust, debris, and wind, and block UV rays that can lead to medical conditions in the dog's eyes. By 2012, doggles reached revenue of $3 million in a single year. Not bad for a pair of shady Rover Ray-Bans. Number 9. The Pet Rock Pet Rock is a collectible that was dreamt up in 1975 by advertising executive Gary Dahl. Pet Rocks are smooth stones from Mexico's Rosarito Beach. Yes, a big pebble sold like a real living pet. Each Pet Rock came in its own custom cardboard box with a straw and breathing holes. It was a short-lived fad that lasted about six months, and Dahl's Crazy Rocks were sold for $3.95, profiting him $3 per sale. 
It's estimated that he sold more than 1.5 million of them, making him a millionaire in a very short period of time. Dahl passed away in March 2015 at age 78. Speaking to the Washington Post, his wife said the pet rock craze was great fun when it happened. In the telephone interview, she also explained that people would come to her husband with weird ideas, expecting him to do for them what he had done for himself. And a lot of times, they were really, really stupid ideas. Number 8. The Million Dollar Homepage Alex Chu was able to earn almost exactly $1 million through a truly unique idea he had. Late one night in August 2005, he lay down in bed with a pen and paper and brainstormed cheap ideas that he could sell a million of. Chu came up with pages full of potential creations, including a terrible product he called the Gum Slinger, which was a small pouch for used chewing gum. But this entrepreneurial genius knew he would get there eventually and came up with the idea of selling space on his website as advertisements. Each pixel on the page would sell at $1 and so a page with 1 million pixels would make him a millionaire. When the site went viral, companies, businesses, and organizations all around the world jumped at the chance to have their name plastered on the site. Tu made his money in just one year and more than enough to fund the 21-year-old student's university fees. So what happened to Tu? He actually dropped out of university and went on to launch a number of other tech ideas, eventually hitting the jackpot with the Calm app. Today, Calm has 600,000 paying subscribers, and according to online media site The Hustle, the company is raising a $25 million round led by Insight Ventures, which will value them at $250 million. Number 7. The iFart app. Yep, it's true. An app that acted as a virtual whoopee cushion with a variety of fart noises to select, the iFart app became immensely popular and despite its low price of 99 cents, went on to make more than $1 million. Back in 2008, Wired Magazine reported that the app was making nearly $10,000 in a single day. Joel Com, developer of iFart Mobile, published download statistics of his app at the time and it stood at number one overall with over 13,000 downloads. Com made a fortune and even appeal to the stars. In 2015, he publicly reached out to George Clooney after the world-famous actor had revealed in a 2011 interview with Rolling Stone magazine that he loved fart jokes and even kept the iFart app on his phone. Com offered to feature one of Clooney's farts as a special in-app purchase. Number 6. The Mood Ring in 1975, the Mood Ring hit stores. It was invented by Joshua Reynolds, who marketed them as portable biofeedback aids. These funky finger rings were a piece of jewelry that purportedly changed color to reflect your mood at any given time. Reynolds was able to get the department store Bonwit Teller to stock the product as part of their accessories line. Some rings sold for as much as $250, which in the 1970s was a hefty price tag. But the 70s was also the era of lava lamps, flare jeans, and extravagant rock bands like Led Zeppelin, and within months, Reynolds made his first million and turned them into a trendy fashion item among celebrities such as Barbra Streisand and Muhammad Ali. Of course, the mood ring was a gimmick, and though the thermotropic liquid crystals used in the rings changed color, it was in response to changes in body temperature, but Reynolds still picked a winner and made his millions. Number 5. The Magic 8-Ball if you were to grab the Magic 8-Ball off your desk and ask it, will the Infographic Show channel answer all the questions I have and more, the words, without a doubt, would hopefully emerge through the murky blue liquid. While Magic 8-Ball did not exist in its current form until 1950, the original idea, the Psycho Seer, was invented by Albert C. Carter and inspired by a spirit-writing device used by his mother Mary, a Cincinnati clairvoyant. Unfortunately, Carter died before his clever creation found success. But in 1950, his brother-in-law, Abe Bookman, was commissioned to turn the Psycho Seer into a black and white eight ball with a floating 20-sided die. When the ball is shaken, the die floats to the surface, revealing its answer to your question about the future. In 2011, Time Magazine listed it at number 18 of all-time 100 greatest toys, and you can still buy the Magic 8 Ball today. Number 4. Big Mouth Billy Bass At some point, just about everyone will have seen a talking, singing fish like Boogie Bass or Rocky Rainbow Trout hanging on the wall of a grocery store, the local bar, or in someone's home. None were bigger than Big Mouth Billy Bass. It all started out with Joe Pelletieri, who began his career as a self-professed numbers guy, but after nearly 10 years of working in retail, he felt it was time to move on to the next big thing. One day, Pelletieri's wife turned to him with an unusual proposal, saying, how about a singing fish on a plaque? And though it may have sounded 
sounded crazy to most, Pelletier thought the idea of a fish on a plaque singing Al Green was hilarious. A Texas novelty toy company originally created the device in the late 1990s, and for many years it was an uphill battle until Jemmy Industries took the toy on. The summer of 2000 was the toy's heyday, though Pelletieri and Jemmy are highly secretive when it comes to divulging the financial success of Billy. But it has been rumored that the toy made the company over $100 million in revenue during its nine-month success high. A fishy story or the real sales numbers? We may never know. Number 3. The Hula Hoop the hula hoop has been around for millennia, and Native Americans used a hoop dance as a form of storytelling with anywhere from 1 to 30 hoops as props. But the modern hula hoop was patented by Richard Nur and Arthur Spud Mellon of the Whammo Company, who hold the trademark on the name hula hoop. In 1958, Whammo began manufacturing the toy out of plastic tubing, and they sold a whopping 25 million hula hoops in the first four months at a price of $1.98 each. By the end of their second year, they had reached 100 million sold, and they continued to be one of the most successful manufacturers of modern hula hoops. The hula hoop was at its peak back in the 1950s, with more than 50,000 hoops being manufactured every day, without a doubt one of the most simple inventions and successful money spinners ever. Number 2. Fidget Spinners Now to something a little more recent, but still a spinner, and the must-have toy of 2017, the Fidget Spinner. These little spinning toys started flying off the shelves in April of 2017, and several schools have even had to ban them due to them being overly distracting to students. According to a survey of the 200 largest American high schools, nearly a third have banned fidget spinners. The simple design consists of a ball-bearing center with flat, spindly lobes attached like a little propeller. All it takes is a flick, for the stress-relieving toy to work its magic. The only catch in this success story is that Catherine Hedinger, who invented the anxiety-reducing device more than two decades ago, stopped manufacturing them a long time ago, and since her patent expired last year, she's had to watch one large company after another produce and sell different versions of the toy without needing to pay her anything. And finally, number one, the Slinky. This is arguably one of the most famous toys in the world. For those living in the Western world, it is virtually impossible to have not come across this spring-like toy at some point in your life. It's a success story that started many years ago. The inventor was a man called Richard James, and he stumbled across the idea by accident when a spring fell and wobbled its way along the floor. James and his wife Betty developed a plan to turn his invention into the next big novelty toy. Betty came up with the name Slinky while James got to work on designing a machine to coil an 80-foot long piece of wire into a 2-inch spiral spring. The couple borrowed $500 to manufacture the first Slinkies. Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia allowed demonstrations for Christmas 1945 and the first 400 Slinkies sold within minutes. They even had a TV jingle done with the words, what walks downstairs, alone or in pairs, and makes a Slinky sound, it's a Slinky. By the time Slinky turned 10 years old, more than 100 million had been sold, and according to Adweek, as of 2015, 350 million were in the hands of customers. It goes down as one of the most popular toys ever, making a family very wealthy indeed. This video is sponsored by Audible, the world's number one provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. Audible has every genre and type of audiobook you could want, from history to comedy to true crime to romance. I just finished listening to Skunk Works, a personal memoir of my years of Lockheed by Ben Rich. And if you like the topics we cover here on the Infographic Show, then you're gonna love this. And now, to make things even better, they've got podcasts too. Everything you need for your audio entertainment needs in one easy place. But the most exciting of all is their new service, Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you get full access to the new Plus catalog, an incredible collection filled with thousands and thousands of select Audible originals, audiobooks, and podcasts, which include ad-free versions of some of the most popular shows in the world, along with exclusive series. Now is the absolute best time to try Audible Plus with this special holiday offer, just $4.95 a month for the first six months, and only $7.95 a month after to download and stream thousands of audiobooks, originals, and podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Sign up now by visiting audible.com infographics or by texting infographics to 500-500. One day in 1912, Franz Reichelt had a sudden flash of inspiration. Today would be the day he became the first man in history to glide from the Eiffel Tower to the ground wearing nothing but a flying suit. What could ever go wrong? He hadn't had the time to test his innovative suit yet, but he was a professional tailor. He had faith in his work and the conviction that he'd reached the ground successfully. As his colleagues put a stool in place for him to mount at the top of the 1,000-foot tower, 
He took a gulp and slowly climbed to the top. It was a long way down. But let's leave Franz at the summit contemplating his rash decision for a while. He's not the only lunatic. Sorry, I mean innovative inventor the human race has known. Thomas Midgley was an acclaimed engineer and chemist who obtained over 100 patents, and he certainly had a knack for creations that would turn out to be dangerous, destructive, or toxic. First, he had the genius idea of adding tetraethyl lead to gasoline to solve the problem of engine knocking in cars. It worked, but it also turned out to damage the environment and the public. The man even gave himself lead poisoning in the process, but he wasn't deterred. His next move was the invention of chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC. You know, the stuff that aerosols release that damages the ozone layer. At the time, CFC was revered as a pioneering invention that would stop refrigerators leaking dangerous substances and gases. CFC was believed to be inflammable, stable, non-corrosive, and safe for humans to breathe. To prove its safety, Midgley himself inhaled a sizable amount of the gas. As we now know, he turned out to be misled. But amazingly, Thomas Midgley wasn't killed by CFC or lead, although his run-ins no doubt did him some damage. Instead, his life took a tragic turn when he contracted polio in 1944 at the young age of 51. Still convinced of his ingenuity as an inventor, Midgley went ahead and invented something. This time, it didn't involve any chemicals or toxic substances. It was a simple yet smart system of strings and pulleys to help him pull himself out of bed independently. Sounds harmless, right? For a few years, the system worked out great, helping Midgley retain the modicum of dignity he still had left after poisoning all of humanity twice. But one day, he became entangled in the ropes, which strangled him to death. Once again, he'd done himself in. Ok, so maybe you're asking for trouble when you go around meddling with chemicals and giving huge heavy contraptions to people who have become semi-paralyzed. But William Bullock was a much more sensible man. He came up with practical inventions like the grain drill, seed planter, and eventually the rotary printing press designed to increase the speed of printing. Surely such a pioneering man wouldn't have such a silly ending. Well, you've seen the title of the video, you already know the answer. Just two years after his brilliant invention that would revolutionize the printing industry, Bullock had a nasty accident while adjusting his rotary press. His leg got caught in the machine and was promptly crushed. I guess health and safety regulations weren't much of a concern in 1867. The inventor didn't die instantly, but it was the start of the end. He contracted gangrene in the wound and ended up dying a few days later. It's a tragic tale. Now, are you ready for something really crazy? Dying was the last thing Alexander Bogdanov had in mind. In fact, he'd hoped to become immortal. Bear with me here. A true polymath, Bogdanov was a science fiction writer, doctor, and cybernetics enthusiast. But it was his passion for medical research that would lead him down a path of insanity and eventually cause his dire end. Researching blood transfusions, Bogdanov became interested in their application to extending lives. Or, in other words, making people immortal. You can tell he was a fan of science fiction. The man was so convinced he was onto something that he performed multiple transfusions on himself before having any proper evidence. It seemed to go well at first, and he enthusiastically published study after study about the positive effects of transfusions. He was convinced his eyesight had improved and even that he'd stopped balding. Unfortunately, Bogdanov didn't pay much attention to where the blood was coming from. One day, he underwent a transfusion from a student who turned out to have malaria, which would lead to his death in 1928. Would it have really been that terrible to be bald and wear glasses? You might say these inventors didn't know any better, but in the case of Horace Hunley, he almost certainly did. Hunley made submarines, which is pretty cool. And what isn't so cool is that he made lousy submarines. His first submarine sank, and not in the good submarine way, but in a sank to the bottom of the ocean to never be found again way. Then he built a second submarine, and that sank too. But Hunley wasn't one to lose confidence that easily. So he went on to build a third submarine. He even funded it with his own money, because presumably sponsorship money was drying up by that point, and he named it after himself. Bold. Sometimes faith is all you need, but not when it comes to science and engineering. The submarine sank in 1963 with Hunley and seven other crew members inside who all died. He obviously hadn't got the memo that insanity is doing the same thing twice and expecting different results. Speaking of insanity, it's now time to look at possibly the craziest guy on the list. His idea was so mad that even Evil Knievel, one of the best known stunt performers and daredevils ever, tried to warn him against it. Enter the Czechoslovakian stuntman Karel Suchek. He had the genius idea to cross the super dangerous Niagara Falls whirlpool using various vehicles. First, he tried a moped along the cables of a trolley but failed when he hit a bolt and was derailed. 
Luckily, he was wearing a safety harness, which stopped him from falling into the whirlpool, and he lived to tell the tale. Then he tried the same thing again in a barrel of steel. This time, he ended up stranded for hours in the whirlpool. Eventually, he was rescued, and once again he survived, although the police charged him for performing an unlicensed stunt. But he wasn't prepared to give up just yet. Suchek's idea of fun is clearly very different from ours, because he decided to cross the whirlpool in a barrel again. Only this time, he custom-built the barrel himself, made of lightweight metal and plastic to be shock absorbent. It even had a two-way radio and a counterweight in one end to ensure Suchek never landed head first. The barrel may have been well thought out, but crossing the whirlpool in a homemade contraption was a bad move. That's why Evil Knievel tried to step in, but Suchek wasn't listening to anyone. So he set off. But something was wrong. The barrel started spinning as it plunged down, so instead of landing in the tank that had been placed at the bottom to weather the landing, it hit the edge. This made a larger impact than planned, giving Suchek a fractured skull and crushing his chest. He was rushed to the hospital and died. Worse of all, the spectacle was part of the Thrill Show and Destruction Derby, and there was an entire audience watching the event take place. Since Suchek was inside the barrel, the spectators didn't realize what had happened, so they clapped and cheered with the impression that the stunt had been successful. But bet they felt bad afterward. Believe it or not, things get crazier. Michael Dacre had a dream. His dream was, wait for it, to build a flying car. We've all been there. Only he actually tried to make his dream a reality. He became a pilot for the British Army and started his own flight crewing service. That's when he invented the jet pod, a tiny airplane designed to have a short takeoff and landing, allowing air passengers to travel straight from airports in the middle of nowhere to city centers. One day, he was testing his prototype in Malaysia. Three times in a row, he tried and failed to set off but he refused to take this as a warning sign. He kept trying. On the fourth attempt, Dacre successfully set off into the air, but instead of a gradual takeoff, the vehicle shot up vertically into the sky and plummeted straight down to the earth. Dacre was killed in the crash. Because it went so well for Dacre, an engineer called Henry Smolinski decided to give the whole flying car thing another go in 1973. One day, he thought he created the perfect flying machine, so he drove it off the Eiffel Tower as a test run a la France. Nah, I'm kidding, but Henry did build a prototype. He fused a Ford Pinto with the rear end of an airplane. Don't ask me why he chose a Ford Pinto as the vehicle of choice for this flagship project. The team also developed a set of adapters so the driver could control the ailerons of the plane with the steering wheel. One day, Smolinski went ahead with an impromptu test of his flying car. Unfortunately, the car had suffered faulty welding and loose parts and the wing strut detached. The weight was also way too much for the engine. Along with his business partner, Smolinski died in a pillar of black smoke. You might have noticed a theme here. People getting into accidents after trying to invent some kind of vehicle. Well, Valerian Abakovsky is no exception and no less insane. He had invented something called the Aero Wagon, a high-speed rail car complete with an aircraft engine and propeller traction that he wanted to use to transport Soviet officials between major cities. One day, he gave the vehicle a test run. I know you heard it all before, the test run went fine for the outgoing journey. But on the return, the car was going at high speed when it derailed, killing Abakovsky and five other communists. I'm not done yet. Rocket science has a bad rep for its difficulty, but that wasn't going to deter Max Valier. After reading about the joys of rockets, he set out on a mission to develop a rocket-powered car. Don't worry, he wasn't hoping to fly it, he just wanted it to go really, really fast. Eventually, he created a car that could go 250 miles per hour. Perfect and so useful if what you're looking for is a car with the capacity to cause road accidents. He then began to work on a rocket-assisted aircraft. In 1920, Max was working on a rocket motor made of liquid oxygen gasoline when the entire thing exploded. A piece of shrapnel flew into one of his arteries, severing it and killing him. The car never came to be, but Max's death wasn't in vain. The technology he worked on helped the first man land on the moon. Now, ready to hear something gruesome? It's not just the last few centuries that it's become in vogue for inventors to kill themselves using their own inventions. As early as 221 BC, influential politician Li Si got in on the trend. Li Si invented a torture method called the Five Pains, which involved cutting off the nose, hand, and foot of a person before castrating them and killing them by cutting them in half. He was a real charmer. Some inventors wanted to make the world a better place, others just want to find more ways to bring suffering. When Li Si was convicted of treason, he got a taste of his own medicine and met the same fate. And they say karma isn't real. But back up to our plucky Taylor Franz who's still waiting at the top of the Eiffel Tower, ready to jump. 
Franz had designed his wingsuit based on the principle that by adding more surface area to the body, humans would be able to descend to the ground slowly and gracefully. Luckily, he wasn't so deluded that he thought a special suit alone could enable humans to fly. He also added in a parachute that would be released during the fall. What could ever go wrong? Remember, this wingsuit had never actually been tested. The original plan was to have a test run with a dummy, but Franz was something of a free spirit. For him, it was a matter of pride to show faith in his inventions and take the first jump with no evidence behind him. The wingsuit he created looked like a cloak with a big hood, so it's hard to be optimistic about its effectiveness. But what about the parachute? Surely that would save him, right? To activate the parachute, all Franz had to do was extend his arms out to put his body into a cross position. Only the parachute collapsed around him, so he had a free fall to the ground. He died of a heart attack before he'd even reached the bottom. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. Microsoft and Apple. Both these tech giants brought computers to the fingertips of people all around the world. Both got their start around the same time and both became iconic worldwide brands in a short period of time. Both diversified in different directions, yet still competed fiercely for market share. But who delivers better products? And who, out of these two, are the more user-friendly and globally compatible? Which of these two giants is the biggest, the best, the fairest, and ultimately superior? They both have their own pros and cons, for sure. And as we'll see in today's episode of the Infographic Show, they each have their own brilliant histories. Let's have a look at these two tech giants in today's show, Microsoft vs. Apple. In the red corner, Microsoft began its humble life with Paul Allen and Bill Gates, who began working together and eventually developed MS-DOS in the mid-1980s. Allen and Gates had been childhood friends since 1972 and enjoyed nothing more than pulling things apart and putting them together again. Gates studied at Harvard while Allen got his degree at Washington State University. They officially formed Microsoft in 1975 and their DOS system rose to dominate the home computer market. Once Microsoft was created, the company made its initial public offering in 1986 and enjoyed a sharp rise in share prices. Today, Microsoft develops computer software, personal computers, internet browsers, and also gaming products such as the Xbox video game machine. It's the world's largest software maker by revenue and one of the world's richest companies creating 3 billionaires and 12,000 millionaires among its own employees. And over in the blue corner are Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne, who founded Apple in 1976 and developed the Apple I personal computer. Sales of Apple II saw some growth in the company, and a few years later Apple had hired a staff of designers and production line workers. Apple shares were sold to the public in 1980 and enjoyed instant financial success. Apple is now the world's most valuable technological company and true innovators in terms of product design and software. They don't always get there first, but they normally design the product that the world finds the most valuable. Like the iPhone, for example. Not the first commercial cell phone by any means, but perhaps the most desirable tech product in the marketplace. And possibly one of the world's most iconic pieces of hardware. As their fortunes have grown, both companies have been aggressive in the art of acquisition and mergers. Microsoft has had 217 acquisitions, including Skype, LinkedIn, Hotmail, Nokia Phones, and Panda Networks. Apple has acquired 94 companies, including Orion Network Systems, SoundJam, Silicon Color, the voice control software Siri, and Beats Electronic. Between Apple and Microsoft, over 300 smaller tech companies have been swallowed up. Apple is the current leader when it comes to brand respectability and profits, but the competition doesn't end there. While Apple is larger than Microsoft, is more valuable, and has more financial clout, Microsoft's stock on the exchange markets grew much faster according to a 2016 financial journal. This suggests that from an investor's viewpoint, Apple has had its day in the sun. In 2016, shares of Microsoft were up 26.5% over the previous year. While at the same time, Apple took an 18.4% decline. More up-to-date statistics tell a different story. The 2018 Forbes report ranked Apple as the number 8 company in the world, with a value of $926.9 billion. Apple ranks number 96 in assets and is considered the world's most valuable brand. Apple is also America's largest public company. Microsoft, meanwhile, is ranked at number 30 with $750.6 billion. 
it is ranked number 56 in sales, number 22 in profit, and number 140 in assets. Microsoft is the world's third most valuable brand and America's ninth largest public company. So when it comes to the hard figures, Apple is the clear winner, but Microsoft isn't far behind. Microsoft spent over 20 years leading the desktop market with Windows. They were a little late to the cell phone party, but they do have some interesting new products such as the MS Surface and Surface Studios. Two companies competing for the same market share are bound to bump shoulders in court now and again. Apple and Microsoft came up head-to-head -head early on in a 1994 copyright infringement case, whereby Apple tried to prevent Microsoft from using visual graphic user interface elements that were similar to those used in Apple's operating systems. The court ruled that Apple could not get patent protection for the idea of a graphical user interface. Both Apple and Microsoft, along with giant Samsung, are big spenders when it comes to patent protections and patent litigations. The tech world is heavily invested into protecting what they create. According to a Stanford University survey, as much as $20 billion was spent on both patent protection and patent litigation in the smartphone industry alone over a period of two years. That's enough cash to finance eight Mars rover missions. The stakes are high when it comes to protecting your technological babies, and both Apple and Microsoft have to keep their new technology safe and sound and wrapped up in patented cotton wool, like the priceless little creations they are. Perhaps the truth is one brand is not better than the other, but they do both have their own domains. Apple has undoubtedly a superior brand respect. Their products are cool and people desire them. Steve Jobs had a vision that computers were not only business tools, they could be brought into the home, whereas Microsoft was focusing firmly on the business office market, at least at first. Apple's vision along with an excellent cutting-edge development and marketing team and the simplicity of their products have made Apple appear, as a brand at least, to be the victor in this battle. They also limited the market with their own Apple Store and brand-specific hardware and software. Whether this is a good thing for the consumer or not is open to debate, but one has to admit that when it comes to branding, Apple is king. Apple often employs product placement in television and feature films. Audiences want to emulate celebrities, and if they see their favorite star using an Apple product, simply because Apple paid the producers of the show to use their product, well, that's a win for Apple. Apple will also supply schools with Apple desktops to have the younger generations touch their products and become used to handling them. Apple designs cool posters and has a desirable brand presence in all corners of the globe. In certain parts of the world, owning an Apple iPhone is almost essential. In other parts of the world, an iPhone is a privilege. Microsoft, on the other hand, holds 85% of the desktop market. And without Microsoft, we would have no Windows, no Hotmail, or Windows Live no affordable products, and no interchangeable components. Being tied to one brand may seem clever, but for the consumer, it kinda sucks. Apple has a sleek line of brand products and has changed the way tech companies brand themselves. Microsoft has given the world computers at an affordable price. They have made it possible for people across the world to join in on the computer world. Microsoft has changed lives in a positive way at an affordable price with no fancy branding tricks and gimmicks. In the end, it would be a shame to live in a world where we only had one choice, Apple or Microsoft. Ultimately, it really is a personal choice. Do you desire a product that is cheap and can be upgraded and adapted easily? Or would you prefer to be locked into one super sleek brand? Imagine what would happen if a country destroyed its tech industry overnight. In most cases, this would lead to economic collapse and societal chaos. Yet, as you watch this video, China is doing just that. The craziest part is that the drastic actions taken by the Chinese government to dismantle their own tech industry might just save the country in the future. China has been a major player in the global tech industry since the early 2000s. However, it now seems that the Chinese government has done a full 180 and is trying to destroy all of the innovations and hard work its tech companies have engaged in over the past two decades. This seems insane, and it might just be, but many analysts believe that by cracking down on its tech sector, China might position itself to not just thrive but control many of the policies and regulations that will govern how tech companies operate around the world. Make no mistake, China is not just implementing a few regulations, they are actively destroying specific parts of their tech industry in order to force a major paradigm shift. In recent years, tech icons like Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, have disappeared and China has leveled incredibly huge fines against some of their most lucrative tech companies. The Chinese government is not just trying to regulate certain companies in their country, they are trying to eviscerate them. 
So how could a government waging war on one of its biggest economic sectors be good for it? Let's pick China's policies and regulations apart and see if there's any sanity in what they're doing. It should come as no surprise that the regulations are being put in place as a way for President Xi Jinping to seize power from major tech giants. He's also using this systematic reorganization to focus the sector on what he believes the future of China should be. Before the crackdown, most of China's biggest tech companies were concentrated on software, platforms, and apps that collect user data. This data was used for advertising and selling products to consumers and is exactly what Alibaba, which is basically the Amazon of China, has been doing since the early 2000s. Chinese companies were also investing large amounts of time and resources into cryptocurrency and various social media platforms. Xi and his associates want China's tech industry to move away from these superficial sectors and focus more on physical hardware such as microprocessors, robotics, semiconductors, and electric vehicles. In order to get the ball rolling, China enacted numerous regulations that would protect user data, increase cybersecurity, and squash anti-competitive practices. This might have hurt larger tech companies in China, but it hurt foreign companies working in China that could not comply with the new regulations even more. This provided small and medium-sized Chinese tech companies an advantage in the hopes that it would lead to greater innovation. The anti-monopoly rules that China's put in place keep large tech companies from scooping up all their competitors or forcing them out of business. This has helped smaller businesses survive, while also forcing tech giants to focus their attention on the expansion outside of China. This can be beneficial for the company itself, but also spreads China's power of influence. And when it comes down to it, many of the things she is doing to destroy the tech industry are so it can be rebuilt in a way that will provide China with more power. And although the Chinese government seems to have good intentions while dismantling the tech sector, analysts worldwide are nervous about the repercussions that might arise. As China's no-COVID policy slows production and leads to more and more protests and unrest, their economy is hurt. These factors, on top of the drastic changes being made to the tech industry, which accounts for over 30% of the country's GDP, should definitely set off some internal warning bells. But China is a huge market, which means it has leverage when it comes to its foreign and economic policies. China has a massive consumer base, so most companies need to play ball with their government to tap into the country's population. This means that even though the new tech laws and regulations might be restrictive and cause foreign companies to spend large sums of money to restructure their business models and conform to the new Chinese laws, they have no choice but to comply. The new personal information protection law, data security law, and anti-monopoly rules targeting the tech industry were taken from the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. This means that tech companies operating in Europe should also be able to adjust their practices in China and vice versa. China's made it very clear that any company that does not meet their regulations will be fined heavily or in extreme circumstances won't be allowed to operate in China. This is not an option for most tech companies that rely on the Chinese market for a decent chunk of their profits. Businesses within and outside China are now changing their procedures to ensure they don't lose access to this vital market. This is good news for Chinese tech companies because it means that everyone's playing by the same rules. These new regulations have far-reaching effects. Since tech companies are changing their practices to allow them to operate in China, it means global economic norms are shifting as well. By forcing companies to conform to China's policies, it allows Chinese tech companies easier access to the global market. Basically, China is rewriting global tech rules through the dismantling of their own tech industry. But this is not all. In fact, the destruction of tech companies within China through their strict regulations has greatly benefited the government in a somewhat sinister way. Even though many of the restrictions China is placing on the tech industry have to do with data collection, the government is happy to continue these practices for its own purpose. These new laws require foreign tech companies operating in China to provide more detail while simultaneously restricting them from sharing data they collect about Chinese citizens with outside parties. This is a double-edged sword for tech companies. On one hand, they need to access the Chinese consumer, but on the other, they're providing the Chinese government with a massive amount of data that might allow them to force tech companies to do their bidding. This could lead to things such as the 2016 Apple Agreement that promised the company would increase spending within China by $275 billion. Obviously, this was a huge win for the Chinese economy and the government. So although the new laws are hurting Chinese tech companies, the pros far outweigh the cons for the Chinese government. But forcing foreign companies to adhere to their strict rules is only one part of the plan. By getting rid of tech monopolies in China, the government hopes to stimulate innovation. 
By hurting the tech companies that have become too big, China believes more competition will arise between smaller businesses. This often leads to advances on a particular industry, which is what China hopes will happen in their technology sector. Recently, only a handful of companies have dominated the industry. Whenever a new company comes up with a good idea or creates software that's better than what already exists, they're acquired by one of those corporations. Other times, these large tech firms use more nefarious practices such as stealing intellectual property. But since they control so much of the industry, there's very little a small company can do to stop them. To be fair, this is not just a problem in China. These types of predatory practices happen all the time around the world. Companies like Amazon, Apple, and Google constantly acquire competitors and have a slew of legal actions brought against them for stolen programs or property. Unfortunately, like with all tech giants, China's companies have an army of lawyers and strategists who ensure that more often than not, what the company wants, the company gets. However, China has now stripped away the ability of large tech firms to use such tactics within the country. It will not stop these practices completely, but it will force already established companies to compete with startups to improve their own products, because if they don't, they will lose customers. When we examine China's crackdown on the tech industry more closely, it's very clear that the decisions made were calculated and deliberate. Out of all the tech companies that have been fined or ruined by China's new regulations, around 95% were software or platform companies, while only the remaining 5% were hardware businesses. This paints a clear picture of the direction in which the Chinese government wants to take its technology sector. President Xi has made it very apparent. He wants China to become more self-sufficient. He's even stated, Our dependence on core technology is the biggest hidden trouble for us. Heavy dependence on imported core technology is like building our house on top of someone else's walls. No matter how big and how beautiful it is, it won't remain standing during a storm. She knows that regardless of how powerful China's software and internet companies are, it won't matter if they can't build state-of-the-art computers or keep up with advances being made by other countries. Therefore, the main reason that such harsh regulations have been put into place to dismantle the Chinese tech industry is so the entire sector can begin pivoting toward hardware manufacturing and development while software is only relied on as a secondary product. Huge emphasis is being placed on microprocessors, robotics, and semiconductors. She and his advisors see this as the future, and they are likely right. Left to their own devices, the Chinese tech industry would continue mining user data and providing Chinese citizens ways to escape real life online through social media and in a future metaverse. This is because large tech companies have been doing this for years, and it's been very profitable. There's no incentive for these companies to focus on hardware when they could continue making money with online shopping, social media, and video games. But these things don't keep a country competitive in the global market, so it's clear that the destruction of China's tech companies is an attempt to force more innovation and to develop technological self-reliance for the country. Interestingly, the regulations are also being used to scare away certain companies. It might seem odd that China would want to force foreign businesses out of their market when they bring in considerable amounts of money for the economy, but like with everything else, it's all part of Xi's crazy plan. In Xi Jinping's mind, he's put China in a win-win situation. If foreign tech companies adhere to the new strict regulations, he'll have leverage over them. If they don't follow his regulations and decide to leave, Xi and his advisors believe that domestic companies will take their place. And of course, these businesses will be funded by an answer to the Chinese government. What this means is that either way, she has some form of control over all the tech companies manufacturing hardware within China's borders. Ideally, he wants the majority of hardware to be produced by state-sponsored businesses, but right now, he'll take either option. She and the other main players in the Chinese government have noticed how far behind the United States the country is in terms of semiconductor manufacturing, aerospace engineering, and biotech. Obviously, this is not what China wants, which is another reason for the overhaul of the tech industry. China is already a world leader in software and programming. This is why the government doesn't need to grow the industry further. Instead, they want to focus on China's shortcomings. In 2021, the Chinese government invested in all-time high in tech companies developing semiconductors and biotechnology. With all the new regulations and refocusing of the tech industry in China, other world powers have begun to take notice. Unsurprisingly, the United States is keeping a close eye on what's happening within their adversaries' borders. Even though the Chinese government's plan to destroy its tech industry might have seemed crazy at first, it now appears to be working. In February 2022, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce reported that the dismantling of China's tech industry was actually giving the country the money and talent it needed to develop an economic advantage over the U.S. It might seem unbelievable, but it would appear that China's destruction and reorganization of its tech sector is having the outcome they'd hoped for. 
China has doubled down on its plans, and the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology declared it would create 600 little giants in 2018. What they meant by this is that the government would back 600 startups that focused on hardware, strategic technologies, and computing equipment. They succeeded in this effort and have even expanded the number of these startups to 4,500. China plans to fund another 5,000 little giants over the next few years. The Chinese government is very serious about changing the way its tech industry operates, and as you'll see, it's not afraid of who gets hurt. Back in 2021, the Chinese government fined Alibaba $2.8 billion, the largest fine levied against a company ever. They did this by citing anti-competitive behavior perpetrated by the company. Alibaba is still operating and making profits, but this just goes to show how serious China is about restructuring its technology sector. This was not a one-off case. China has imposed huge fines on several big tech companies in the country. And although they're doing this to shift businesses toward hardware manufacturing, there's another, more sinister reason. The big tech companies gained too much power in the government's eyes. It was clear they could influence decisions made at even high levels and impact how the average Chinese citizen thought and acted. This was unacceptable to the government. As is well known, Xi does not handle threats to his power very well. The destruction of the tech giants in China is also being done to lessen their power and make sure the government is the only one controlling the general population. The government knew it was dangerous to allow non-state-run companies to have the ability to manipulate the public by collecting user data, controlling what social media and news content they saw, and providing them with online experiences they couldn't get enough of. Big tech companies overstepped, and in a country led by an authoritarian regime, threatening the government's power is never a good thing. The destruction of the tech industry was certainly motivated by the wants and needs of China to become more self-sufficient. However, it was also a play to consolidate power back to the government itself. But the government has also recognized an opportunity in the tech giants. Xi and those close to him saw how influential big tech companies had become and encouraged them to grow their user bases and footprint in other parts of the world. China's National Development and Reform Commission even released guidance on how software and platform companies could further expand their international capabilities to be competitive on the global stage. Really, what was happening was the Chinese government wanted these tech giants to stop siphoning money from the Chinese government and start bringing in more foreign money. It appears that tech companies listened to the commission and began expanding their influence beyond China's borders. In 2021, Tencent, a multimedia and video game company, extended their reach into Europe. Didi, a ride-hailing app, has a similar number of users as Uber in nine different countries. And let's not forget that TikTok is a Chinese company that beat Google as the world's most visited website for part of 2021. Once again, the Chinese government's crackdown on tech companies has done exactly what it hoped for. The rest of the world watched, stunned as fines and regulations were thrown at Chinese tech giants by their own government. Destroying the status quo within the industry allowed them to refocus on innovation, growth, and manufacturing, while also expanding China's influence via their tech company's products and data collection across the world. The long-term effects of these decisions appear to benefit the Chinese people as well. The law now requires companies to report data breaches, which they were previously not required to do. Also, false advertising and misleading promotions now receive much harsher penalties, which better protect Chinese consumers from being scammed. These new laws required that tech companies clean up their acts and operate more ethically. International attention has even been drawn to several Chinese tech businesses as they've made it onto lists of companies that have improved digital rights. Obviously, not everyone's happy about China's success after blowing up their tech industry. For years, the United States has been outcompeting China in microchip and semiconductor technologies. However, in 2021, China's Yangtze Memory Technologies created a memory chip that outperformed the most powerful chips from both Intel and Samsung. The US has opened several investigations into Chinese tech companies and their practices, but these lawsuits cannot stop them from innovating and spreading their product to other countries across the globe. As of right now, OceanBase, which Alibaba funded, is the fastest database in the world. In fact, it is twice as fast as the second quickest database, which is run by the US company Oracle. Things are not going great right now in China, but this has little to do with the way the Chinese government cracked down on the tech industry. China spends around 70 billion more dollars than the US on research and development. This allows them to turn more innovations into commercial products for their own citizens and to be shipped around the world. The growth of China's GDP has slowed, but it is still increasing by almost twice as much as the US's. By all indications, the destruction and reorganization of the Chinese tech industry will only lead to more innovations, self-reliance, and a broader influence across the world. 
Even with what appears to be a successful shift in the way Chinese tech companies operate, there are still some doubts that China will manage to recover fully from this transition. Many analysts still believe that the Chinese government overextended itself by implementing too many regulations and fines on their tech giants. They cite a lack of freedom for the companies to operate how they see fit as a major problem. Also, the tight restrictions could lead certain tech firms to be so bogged down with legalities they won't be able to innovate or grow. It's hard to tell what exactly is going on within China, as most information coming out of the country comes from state-run sources. However, all we need to do is look at the products we rely on every day, the software we use and the websites we visit, to see how far the arm of the Chinese tech industry reaches. In the United States, large amounts of electronics come from China. People spend enormous amounts of time on TikTok, where user data is collected and shared with other companies and the Chinese government. So much of the criticism about the restructuring of the Chinese tech industry may be coming from fear rather than unbiased opinions. If nothing else, one thing is for sure, Chinese tech companies seem to be weathering the storm and innovating in new ways to keep them relevant. Over the next several years, industry leaders and governments will need to closely watch the tech, hardware, and platforms coming out of China. The unrest and policies in the country might stifle growth, but it's being dealt with similarly to how the tech industry was. Xi and his associates are cracking down hard. It is unclear whether this will lead to more protests or if it will beat the Chinese people into submission. Although it is technically the People's Republic of China, the actual people have very little say in what happens. Xi Jinping is an authoritarian ruler and will not be giving up his powers anytime soon. This is why Chinese tech companies have to comply with the onslaught of regulations, lawsuits, and fines. That being said, the tech industry seems to be ramping back up. Strides are being made with electric cars, artificial intelligence, and semiconductors. On top of that, China is becoming more self-reliant within its tech sector and investing heavily in biotechnology. If everything continues to go as planned, China will have the most dominant tech industry in the world. These are uncertain times and initially all signs pointed to a disaster when the Chinese government destroyed its tech industry, but it's coming back with a vengeance, which means that its demolition might have been what saved it. Somewhere out in the Nevada desert, a strange vehicle tears across the landscape. It's tracked like a tank, except it sports oversized treads in comparison with its relatively small body, which only holds two occupants. It also moves faster than a tank, hitting speeds of up to 60 miles an hour, while retaining its ability to climb grades as high as 70 degrees. Yet what exactly is this tiny super tank good for? And why is the US Army so interested in it? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're taking a look at the Ripsaw, the possible US Army's futuristic luxury tank. The Ripsaw has been around since at least 2002, but it started to gain fame in 2010 when the US Army began testing the vehicle for possible adaptation into its inventory. It wasn't until Fast and Furious 8, though, that the rest of the public got a very impressive look at the capabilities of the Ripsaw, making its big screen Hollywood debut and wowing audiences with its speed, maneuverability, and versatility. Yet, as badass as the Ripsaw seems, and admittedly, it does look pretty badass in pretty much everything it does, the US Army has, after nine years of testing, still not found a use for the Ripsaw. Original interest in the Ripsaw stemmed from President Obama's order that the US military begin slowly shifting its focus from fighting low-intensity conflicts around the world against insurgent or terrorist forces back to countering the growing power of China and Russia. Over the course of the US's global war on terror, the military has seen its capabilities to fight large-scale high-intensity conflicts severely atrophy, putting it at risk should war break out between US and China or Russia. Whereas once the US Army was focused on countering hordes of Russian tanks across the plains of Eastern Europe, its focus shifted on developing a smaller, much more mobile and responsive force that could best respond to the threats posed by insurgents and terrorists. Investments in new weapons and technologies were prioritized for tech and gadgets that gave soldiers an edge in the house-to-house -house urban fighting of America's war against terrorists, or in surveillance technologies and rapid response kinetic attack capabilities for quickly eliminating high-profile individuals as they appeared. With Russia kicking off a moderately successful rearmament program in the early 2010s, which continues to this day, and China seeking to grow its naval and air force capabilities in a bid to challenge the US for supremacy over the Pacific, President Obama started a slow recalibration of the US military's mission from low-intensity conflict back to its roots as a force meant to fight and defeat two major powers simultaneously anywhere in the world. 
That meant a reinvestment in frontline combat systems, such as tanks, anti-tank weapons, and new bombers. Yet the slow expansion of Russian ground forces and their increasing adaptation of ground combat drones sees a need for the US to supplement its infantry with a light tank or light tank equivalent. Currently, the US Army finds itself with a pressing need for a light anti-tank weapon system that's fast, agile, and somewhat survivable, which is where interest in the Ripsaw kicked off. With a 750 horsepower diesel engine, the Ripsaw has about half the power of an Abrams, but on a much lighter body. This lets the two-seater Speed Demon reach speeds as high as 60 miles per hour, while giving it the agility and power to scale steep inclines as high as 70 degrees. Its oversized tracks make it the perfect off-road vehicle, and in testing, it's proven that there's very little terrain that can stop the Ripsaw. So why isn't the US Army adopting what seems like an obvious fit? For starters, the small crew capacity makes the Ripsaw a bit of an unappealing option, yet the vehicle does come with built-in capabilities for being remote control. With the heavy investments by Russia into electronic warfare, which greatly outclass America's own efforts, a remote control functionality is not very appealing at the moment. While a new focus in 2010 for the development of more robust electronic warfare capabilities in order to catch up to and exceed Russia and China, this may make the Ripsaw more appealing in the future. But as it stands, the US military is leery of investing heavily into unmanned ground combat vehicles, exactly because of the advantage that Russia currently has in electronic warfare technologies. The reasoning is simple, and it makes a lot of sense. Losing control of a drone flying over a battle space means losing a set of ears and eyes, but losing a frontline combatant means losing a significant force multiplier and putting friendly troops at great risk. Even in a manned configuration though, the Ripsaw is too lightly armored to really fit the light tank role required by the US Army, who has fast-tracked an acquisitions program meant to procure a valid vehicle for the role. Right now, the Army is being forced to rely on Bradley's and an expensive upgrade program for some of its striker fleet to fill the role, and a dedicated light tank platform is desperately needed. The job of a light tank is to quickly move in and out of combat and outmaneuver the heavy main battle tanks, while providing fire support in situations where big main battle tanks aren't available or can't operate safely in. Relying on speed and firepower, a light tank should be able to knock out a main battle tank, while providing at least some survivability should it be struck in return. At minimum, a light tank should be resistant to 50 caliber and limited RPG fire, drawing fire for and protecting the infantry it directly supports. Yet the Ripsaw is completely unarmored, providing zero protection for its crew. The vehicle is also simply too light, weighing in at only 9,000 pounds, while an Abrams comes in at 70 tons. This lightweight means that the Ripsaw is not suitable for many of the heavier fire support options that a light tank needs. In fact, the Ripsaw is only rated to house the common remotely operated weapon station, which is capable of mounting the M2 50 caliber machine gun, the Mark 19 automatic grenade machine gun, or an M240 Bravo or M249 saw. While all of these weapons would make for great fire support against targets such as terrorists and insurgents, none of them pack the punch necessary to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a modern armored vehicle. Russia, for example, fields the Sprut SD light tank, which features a 125mm main gun with a 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. Its main gun can also fire anti-tank guided missiles, if available. Armored with aluminum and steel, the Sprut is able to protect from 23mm cannon rounds, small arms fire, and artillery splinters. If the Russian Sprut were to come face to face with a Ripsaw, the Ripsaw would be a mess of mangled metal in seconds. Yet the US Army has been trying very hard to find a place for the Ripsaw, and consistently failing. While the Ripsaw can be armed with a Javelin anti-tank missile and could in theory make for a good tank killer, its complete lack of protection once more makes it an incredibly unappealing option for the role. Troops potentially assigned to operate the Ripsaw against a Russian tank would not be blamed for remembering the terrible Shermans from World War II, which were notorious for exploding after a single hit by a German panzer. This earned the Sherman the nickname Ronson after a cigarette lighter amongst the Germans, because just like the lighter, a Sherman would always light up the first time every time. 
With such equally bad protection, if not worse, at least a Sherman could withstand small arms fire, assignment to a Ripsaw against modern Russian forces would be tantamount to suicide. Alternatively, the Ripsaw has also been reviewed for possible use as an ambulance, and indeed here its high speed and extreme maneuverability make it a very appealing prospect. Yet again though, its limited crew capacity sinks the hopes of using a Ripsa as a battlefield ambulance, as the vehicle could fit at best a single casualty with no room for an attending medic. Not to mention that in modern conflict casualties would be in the dozens, necessitating a vehicle that could accommodate several casualties at once. In the end, the Ripsa has yet to be formally rejected by the US military, but it has also failed to find a place in its inventory. We here at the Infographics Show suspect that the only reason the US Army is still testing the Ripsa and trying to figure out how it could fit in the current fleet is because without a doubt, the vehicle is quite badass. It's fast, agile, and can take you literally anywhere. But with zero battlefield capabilities, we think it's time that the Army grow up and put its toys away. Because the time to focus on serious weapon systems for future conflicts is definitely now. A food crisis could be looming on the horizon. It's estimated that there will be 9 billion people on Earth by 2050, and our current methods of food production may not be able to keep up with the demand. For instance, raising cattle requires a lot of food, land, and water, but yields little edible meat in return. An Economist article states that a cow takes 8 kilograms of feed to produce 1 kilogram of beef, but only 40% of the cow can be eaten. We have to be more efficient in the way we grow food and find alternatives to some foods we currently eat in order to be able to feed more people. And we will examine some of these alternatives in this episode of the Infographics Show. What will we eat in the future? High on the list of foods experts predict we will be eating in the future are insects. Humans eating insects is not a new concept. There's even a fancy term for it, entomophagy. It's estimated that insect consumption already occurs in 80% of the nations in the world. For example, the mopane worm is a protein-packed food source for people living in southern Africa. The worms are usually collected in the wild and are traditionally sun-dried or smoked, and they are also canned and sold in local markets. People in Peru commonly eat suri, which is a palm weevil larva. They roast, fry, and barbecue the grubs. But one source notes that locals in jungle towns prefer to offer it to visitors not just raw but live and wriggling. Other popular edible insects include cicadas, ants, scorpions, and tarantulas. One major advantage of using insects as a food source is sustainability. Due to their small size, a lot of insects can be raised in a small amount of space and do not require as much food or water as some traditional farm animals. For example, The Economist reports that crickets require just 1.7 kilograms of food to produce 1 kilogram of meat, and 80% is considered edible. The food to edible meat ratio for mealworms is also better than that of cattle. A Scientific American article states that mealworms can convert about 2.2 kilograms of food into a kilogram of total bug weight. To make one kilogram of protein, they also require just one-tenth of the amount of land required to produce one kilogram of beef. In addition, insects are nutritious. Three bugs in particular, crickets, grasshoppers, and mealworms, are gaining attention as good sources of protein that rival animal protein. In a 2013 report, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization lists the average protein content of these three insects. Crickets contain 8 to 25 grams of protein per 100 grams, while yellow mealworms contain 14 to 25 grams of protein. It's possible for crickets and mealworms to contain as much protein as raw beef, which contains 19 to 26 grams of protein per 100 grams. Adult grasshoppers can contain even more protein than raw beef, with 13 to 28 grams of protein per 100 grams. They also contain slightly less protein than a similar amount of chicken breast, which a Time article states is 31.02 grams of protein per 100 grams of chicken. However, there are also disadvantages to eating insects. One of them is the cost. While it should cost less to raise insects in theory because they require less resources, this is not the case in reality. For instance, a Forbes article explains that the high cost of cricket protein products is due to the fact that the industry of farming crickets is still in its infancy, and the products are indeed pricey. One source states that the average retail price of pure cricket flour is about $40 per pound. 
A BBC article outlined some of the potential safety problems of humans eating insects. For instance, wild insects may be covered in pesticides or other contaminants, while farm-raised ones could be feeding on food scraps that may be contaminated with fungus. Another problem is that insects have their own pathogens, viruses, bacteria, and fungi that colonize their tiny bodies. The health risks posed by these microorganisms within insects needs further study. And then there is the yuck factor. Insects are a hard sell in countries where people are not accustomed to eating insects and were raised to see insects as pests instead of snacks. Edible insect companies have tried to make insects more palatable to these people by grinding up the insects into protein powder and protein bars so that they don't have to see the whole bugs staring back at them with dead eyes as they eat. There has also been an attempt to rebrand insects with names such as mini livestock and land shrimp, but the effectiveness of this rebranding remains to be seen. For some, a bug is still a bug no matter what you call it. If insects don't appeal to you, perhaps you might like the next food of the future we'll discuss, algae. This diverse group of organisms are capable of photosynthesis, but may not have stomata and other tissue found in land plants. They live in both freshwater and marine environments. A few examples of algae include microalgae, such as spirulina and seaweed. Like insects, growing algae is sustainable. A BBC article even states that some in the sustainable food industry predict algae farming could become the world's biggest cropping industry. A Netherlands-based algal research facility called Algae Park states that microalgae pose no competition to agriculture since they don't need fertile land and can be grown in places like deserts. Seaweed grows in the ocean and other bodies of water, so it doesn't require land like other conventional food sources do. Algae are also nutritious. A Live Science article reports that spirulina is well known for its health benefits. Spirulina contains significant amounts of calcium, niacin, potassium, magnesium, B vitamins, and iron. It is also a source of essential amino acids according to the National Ocean Service. Seaweed is chock full of vitamins, minerals, and fiber, and may contain anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial agents. Some seaweed also possesses powerful cancer-fighting agents. Algae have drawbacks that are similar to those of insects. Algae products are also expensive. An online retailer sells a 1.1 pound bag of 100% non-GMO spirulina powder for $19.95, while another one sells a 1 pound jar of raw living spirulina for $70. A third retailer sells a 1 pound bag of kelp for $27.85. Contamination is also a safety issue for algae. A wellness blog cites the results of a study of spirulina, AFA, and chlorella samples from around the world. It found that the majority of them were contaminated with different types of metals, such as arsenic, aluminum, mercury, or lead. Other types of contamination were found in fillers combined with algae, such as soy protein isolate. One source notes that seaweed can also be contaminated by heavy metals such as lead and mercury lurking in the environment where they're grown. In addition, some types of seaweed absorb more toxins than others. Like insects, algae suffer from an image problem. Raw spirulina looks slimy and tastes as bad as it looks. One wellness website states that it does taste like pond scum, while a spirulina blog describes spirulina from the sea as usually gross and smells fishy. According to a BBC article, seaweed is not eaten very much by people living in Western countries. This article speculates that this is because they don't like the idea of eating something washed up and smelling on the seashore. If you still want animal protein, there is a sustainable way to get it – growing it in a laboratory. Our third food of the future, meat grown in a lab, goes by several names – in vitro meat, cultured meat, and clean meat. A Vox article describes the production process. Stem cells and other cells are taken from an animal and placed in a growth medium described as a soup of nutrients that mimics what happens in the animal's body. The cells are allowed to multiply on what is called a scaffolding that may or may not end up in the end product. Currently, a company called Mosa Meats is able to make a hamburger patty in about 9 weeks according to CNN. While the most well-known clean meat is hamburger, it's possible to grow meat from chicken, fish, and other animals as well. Clean meat offers some advantages over conventional meat. A Scientific American article points out that it could eliminate much of the cruel, unethical treatment of animals that are raised for food. If clean meat is successful, the days of raising cattle and other animals for meat in factory farms and having to slaughter them could come to an end. 
Growing meat in a lab would also be better for the environment. A University of Oxford study found that clean meat production could result in 78% to 96% lower greenhouse gas emissions, use 7% to 45% less energy, 99% less land, and 82% to 96% less water than traditional methods. However, clean meat also has some drawbacks. It is the most expensive of the three foods of the future we've discussed. In 2017, a company called Memphis Meats created chicken tenders from self-reproducing cells at a cost of $9,000 for every pound of chicken, which is more than $1,100 for a single 2-ounce chicken tender, according to one article. Vox reports that this same company provided a public production cost estimate of $2,400 per pound last year. Dr. Mark Post, CEO of Mosa Meats and one of the earliest creators of clean meat, has the goal of offering clean meat hamburgers to the public for maybe $11 a burger. This is nearly three times the amount you would pay for a McDonald's quarter pounder with cheese, which currently costs $3.79 in the United States, according to fastfoodmenuprices.com. Some people are also concerned about the safety of clean meat. It is supposed to be the same as conventional meat, but is it? Does it matter if there are some differences? Clean meat is a new technology, so the long-term effects of eating it are unknown. While the clean meat production process eliminates some of the foodborne pathogens and diseases that are commonly found in live food animals, one source notes that production mistakes may happen. If you are looking to government agencies to determine the safety of clean meat, you might be in for a long wait. According to a Business Insider article, the two federal agencies in charge of regulating meat production in the US, the USDA and the FDA, are having trouble figuring out which one of them should oversee the clean meat industry. This federal turf war might cause clean meat startups to avoid safety regulations in the US altogether and sell their products overseas instead. Like insects and algae, clean meat has a long way to go before it's widely accepted by consumers. According to a science organization called AOCS, clean meat may be considered by some to be unnatural or a frankenfood. In a 2012 survey conducted in Europe, many people had unfavorable views of clean meat, and some responded with visceral reactions that included disgust and fear. However, a more recent 2016 survey of 673 US consumers revealed that about 65% of respondents would be definitely or probably willing to try clean meat. Whether the results of this small survey accurately reflect the attitude of the rest of the people in the US remains to be seen. The First World War is known for its massive casualties in small concentrated areas. Industrialized carnage like that is impossible to imagine today. To try to break the stalemate created by this kind of warfare, both sides of the war created a variety of weapons to give them an edge. Though there were a lot of ways to die on the battlefield, these four weapons were among the deadliest a soldier could encounter on the battlefield. Phosgene gas. When people think of World War I, chemical warfare is probably the first thing that comes to mind. After all, though it wasn't the first or last conflict to use chemical weapons, it saw the greatest use in human history. The most iconic of these chemical weapons was mustard gas. This sickly yellow substance would creep forward menacingly toward the poor souls on all sides that used it. If a soldier did not put his gas mask on quickly enough, he could end up breathing a fatal dose of the gas and die a long, painful death where he would drown in the fluid which would start building up in his lungs. Worse still, even if a soldier put on his gas mask, he could still face serious chemical burns on any exposed areas of skin. But even though the mustard gas injured the most soldiers in World War I, it was not particularly deadly. That grim title goes to phosgene gas. Phosgene gas was one of the most poisonous gases employed by all sides of the war. After first being used in December 1915 against the British in Belgium, it soon started a race to develop more and more of the stuff. Of the roughly 90,000 poison gas deaths in the war, about 85,000 of them were caused by phosgene gas. What made it so deadly wasn't necessarily what it did, but what it did not do. When a person breathes in phosgene gas, the chemicals cause the blood in your body to no longer carry oxygen. Because oxygen no longer reaches your organs, soldiers who breathe in a big enough dose would typically die of suffocation or a heart attack. Unlike mustard gas, the effects of the poison could take up to 48 hours to manifest themselves, meaning that a sleeping soldier could breathe in the deadly gas without realizing. It also didn't help that phosgene gas was colorless and almost odorless. Though some troops claimed it smelled like old hay, most survivors of these attacks reported no smell at all. It also didn't help that the troops frequently thought that artillery shells that carried the gas were duds, since they did not explode, luring them into a false sense of security. 
But even if they did, phosgene gas was much heavier than other poison gases, meaning that when it got to the dugouts and trenches, it would sink rapidly to where soldiers were most vulnerable when they were hiding, sleeping, or eating. However, thankfully for the troops, even though this poison gas was very deadly, it wasn't often used in battle. After all, neither side wanted to inadvertently expose their own troops to it if the wind shifted. Also, neither side could fire it during an attack since the troops would refuse to take ground that was recently exposed to phosgene gas. Because of this, phosgene gas attacks were limited to weakening the other side while they waited to plan their next move. The French 75mm Field Gun Statistically, artillery fire was the number one killer of World War I. According to British medical reports, about 58% of all casualties were caused by artillery, with the Germans reporting similar numbers. This figure makes sense as frontal troop assaults didn't happen daily. Instead, most of the fighting in World War I involved waiting around in trenches for weeks or months on end while each side blasted the other with artillery until the next big offensive. Because of this, troops were exposed to artillery fire quite literally 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And for artillery, the numbers involved were massive. During the war, both sides fired tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of shells daily. With all that fighting, both sides needed guns that could stay on target while shooting large amounts of shells. Early artillery would recoil once shot, meaning their crew would have to push them back into position. The French solved this problem with their Model 1897 75mm field gun. Whenever the gun was fired, the barrel would recoil while the gun remained locked in place, keeping it on target. As the name suggests, it was developed at the end of the 19th century and surpassed all nations in terms of firing capability and accuracy. Other countries tried at first and eventually succeeded in developing a recoil system for their guns, but the French came out swinging, since no one could beat its 30 rounds per minute firing rate. In the first weeks of the war, with French infantry falling back in mass, French military leaders credited the 75mm field gun as what saved France since its rapid-firing accurate shells would decimate troops in the open. However, even as the war evolved into trench warfare, the French still relied on the 75mm gun as the centerpiece of blanketing German positions with fire. Approximately 70% of French shells fired during the war came from this gun. Because about 60% of German casualties came from artillery, it's safe to say that when considering Allied contributions, approximately one in four German losses resulted from this gun. Making it even deadlier was the fact that as the French built better and more accurate guns, they transitioned the 75mm to fire their poison gas shells, making the gun even deadlier. The Type UC-2 Mine-Laying U-Boats The Germans are credited with revolutionizing the art of submarine warfare. Their much-feared U-boats created the manual for conducting offensive submarine operations. While it's hard to quantify the exact damage U-boats did in the First World War, one thing people can quantify is their success. U-boats sank just over 7,600 merchant ships and Allied warships during the war. Of these, about 1,800 were sunk by just one U-boat type, the Type UC-2 mine-laying boats. The German Imperial Navy had 34 different types of U-boats they employed during the war, and the UC-2 was one of the most popular models, with 64 constructed. With such a small number built, the average number of ships sunk per U-boat goes up to almost 30, and the average number of vessels sunk alone makes it the most successful submarine type not just in the First World War, but in all of submarine history. A few new innovative design features made it extremely deadly for merchants and warships alike. Their new double hull design was the most important one for the crew's survivability. In previous submarines, the boat had just one hull. If that got punctured or damaged, it was lights out for the crew. With a double hull design, a thicker armored hull would protect the outside of the sub, while the pressurized inside hull housed the crew and provided secondary protection. Because of this, Allied warships had to get through both hulls to kill the submarine, as many U-boats could survive a penetration of their outer hull while still keeping their inner hull secure. The new model was also about three times bigger than its predecessor, the UC-1. With all that extra room, it could house more powerful engines. With that, the boat could travel about 10,000 nautical miles while surfaced and about 54 nautical miles while below the surface. This enabled it to visit far-flung places around Europe where few expected a submarine to be lurking. Even worse for Allied mariners, the submarine was heavily armed with seven torpedoes in the bow and stern tubes, 18 mines, and a deck gun. That means that after laying out mines, the submarine could still attack convoys. The damage these boats could do was massive. The most successful one in the class, the UC-65, racked up an impressive 106 ships sunk in just one year. They were able to do this due to the new submarine tactics they developed. While attacking a merchant vessel, the U-boats would purposefully get behind them. If their initial torpedoes missed, they could close in and finish them off with their deck gun. 
It was only when merchant ships started moving as a convoy that this tactic stopped being used. The Maxim Machine Gun Machine guns had been around for a few decades before the First World War. These guns were quite rudimentary and suffered mechanical and reliability issues. It wasn't until Hiram Maxim invented his iconic weapon in 1883 that the machine gun became a reliable weapon of war. Once it came out, the armies and navies of the world scrambled to get their hands on it. Maxim knew this would be his crown jewel, and he wanted to make as much money as possible from it. Because of this, he licensed the design to anyone willing to pay for it, and everyone did. Germany, Russia, the UK, and the US all lined up to buy the rights to make their own slightly different machine guns based on their own design principles. The British created the iconic Vickers gun, the Germans made their own called the Spandau, and the Russians made a copy of the Vickers. All of the major powers adopted Maxim's design due to its simplicity. The parts were cheap, countries could easily change the gun, and it would rarely misfire as long as gunners fed it bullets and water into its cooling jacket. Once the war broke out, it was clear that warring armies would soon use machine guns to great effect like the Europeans had done to their colonies over the past 30 years. Only this time, they would develop new tactics that would change the history of war forever. Contrary to popular belief, the average infantry soldier would rarely charge headfirst into certain death against machine guns. Rather, as studies from the Somme have shown, troops would crawl or make quick dashes from crater to crater while crossing no man's land. But that didn't stop either side from consistently firing hundreds of thousands of rounds per day from their machine guns. In fact, by 1917, Germany was devoting 90% of its small arms ammo production to its machine guns. 40% of the casualties on each side were caused by small arms, with machine guns causing most of them. But why were troops firing so many rounds? Instead of firing into waves of infantry, machine guns began to be used for suppressing fire. The warring sides also created specialty machine gun units, where gunners would train just on that weapon system, unlike before when the standard rank-and-file soldier would be good enough. With deadlier, better-trained gunners given free reign to fire day and night, it was no wonder that most machine gun casualties came from the daily small engagements. We live in a time when travel has become cheaper and more convenient than ever. Long haul flights between thousands of destinations, high speed rail, cars, taxis, and Uber, travel solutions for everyone. A hundred years ago, it would take three to five days to travel from New York to London by steamship, but it was only available to the richest of people. Today you can fly, and it takes just five hours with options from economy to luxury. And with Elon Musk bringing rocket power to the masses, future travel times could soon become even shorter. So how quick and convenient can travel really become? What if you were able to pack your bags for the holidays, grab the beach towel and sunglasses, and a split second later arrive at your destination? That's what we'll be exploring today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what if we invented teleportation? Teleportation is the process of relocating a physical object from one place to another without touching it in any way or using any mechanical device directly. The most likely way for this to happen would be by the physical body being dematerialized and disappearing before being reconstructed and reappearing in a different place all in an instant. Just like in Star Trek, Beam Me Up Scotty is the catchphrase that people associate with the popular TV series. It was used in the original series as a command given by Captain James T. Kirk to his chief engineer Montgomery Scott or Scotty when he needed to be transported back to the Starship Enterprise. Kirk would then be teleported back to his ship. Let's imagine for a minute that it was available to all of us today. How would your life change? Well, you could get up in the morning, teleport to China for work, go to Mexico City to meet a friend for some fajitas over lunch, head to a client's office in Sydney for a 20-minute afternoon business meeting, to Paris for beers after work, maybe your partner could join you in Venice for dinner before heading home at the end of your day. Sounds pretty awesome, eh? And many other things would also change with instant travel. A person sitting in Thailand could order the best takeaway pizza from New York City and have it delivered within minutes. Long-distance relationships would become a thing of the past, and you could date any person in any country around the world. And we could solve the issue of overcrowding in cities because everyone would be able to live wherever they wanted to. It's a lifestyle that sounds too good to be true. Surely there would be some downsides to this imaginative reality. In the 1986 movie The Fly, a scientist played by actor Jeff Goldblum creates a teleportation device and decides to test its abilities on himself. But unbeknown to him, a housefly slips into the device during the process. This leads to a merger of man and insect, creating a terrifying human-fly monster combo. However, if this transporting technology existed in the real world, then a fly would be the least of our issues. 
According to Discovery Magazine, we share our bodies harmoniously with 90 trillion or so microbes, so the transported result would be a very strange looking multi-being. Another issue is that to instantaneously transport from one place to another, our bodies would need to become energy and then go back to solid matter. Even if we combine the storages of every computer available today, that would hold just a fraction of the data that makes up one human being, says Caltech physicist Philip Hopkins. And the energy itself isn't anything to scoff at either, he says. It would be like launching all of the US's and Russia's nukes in one spot and trying to contain it. And then there's the question of consciousness. Even if there was enough energy and data storage, and we had a device that could stop you merging with the microbes and bacteria on your body, where would your consciousness end up? Would it materialize at the new destination, or float away, like a feather, leaving you to be stranded zombie-like with a mind floating elsewhere? Let's imagine for a minute that all of these things had solutions. What then? Would it all be plane sailing, holidays, and living wherever we wanted to? One major negative effect, if only short-term, would be on the economy. Airlines, trains, buses, taxis, and nearly all transportation services would go out of business, as would the thousands of manufacturing and services companies that support them. Then there's postal, shipping, and courier companies. The list goes on. Many people would find themselves out of work. Then there's the complication with passports or traveling without them border crossings, and security, which would be put into disarray. A drug trafficker could have a very fast-growing business in the age of teleportation. So there are pluses and minuses to teleportation, and this is all very fun to imagine. But will it ever be possible, I hear you asking? We took a look at a few science journals to see what we could find out, and we came across a process called quantum teleportation. Quantum refers to the smallest scales of energy levels of atoms and subatomic particles, and quantum teleportation is a process by which information about the state of these tiny particles can be transmitted from one location to another. This quantum information transfer has been successfully carried out between Earth and a satellite in space. But don't go trading in your bus pass just yet. Applying these same rules to large objects is not at all straightforward, and even if science does manage to do it, it will more likely be your grandchildren's grandchildren who are around to experience teleportation. When teleportation does ultimately happen, it's sure to change a lot about the way we live our day-to-day -day lives. It's all anyone can talk about. 5G is coming. Some people say it's the ticket to the next great technology evolution, making it easier for us to stay connected at all times. Others are saying it's a mysterious, shadowy, or even dangerous technology that's being pushed on us without knowing what it can really do. Some even claim it could be making us sick. But what is 5G, and what does it have to do with your cell phone? Every time you pick up your mobile phone, whether you're using a powerful smartphone that can do almost anything or a clunky old flip phone, you're using a cellular network. These allow you to reach anyone in the world without anything actually connecting the phones. Back in the day, the only way to use a phone was to use one connected to the wall, sending the signals through physical cords. You might even have seen one of those landlines at your grandma's house. But now, almost everyone has a cell phone. These use radio waves to send the communications instantaneously through a local antenna in the cell. But how is 5G different from all the cell phones that came before it? Well, to get to 5G, there needs to be 4Gs before it. The G stands for generation, and that means we're on the cusp of the fifth massive overhaul in cellular technology. If you were around at the dawn of the cell phone, you might remember those clunky, huge cellular phones that were the size of a landline headset or larger. These were 1G phones. They made their debut in 1979 in Japan. These cellular phones used analog signals and were preceded by rudimentary mobile phones that bypassed the need for a cord. The big development of 1G was that they were the first cellular network to introduce international roaming, which allowed it to connect to other cell phone networks around the world, usually at exorbitant data charges. Many long-distance relationships found that out the hard way. 1G is long extinct now, except a single network in Russia offering limited service. The next big jump in cellular technology was right around the corner. It was Finland, 1991, when the first 2G network was launched. The analog radio signals were now replaced with digital signals, giving the system much more versatility and a greater ability to easily contact people anywhere. Phone conversations were now encrypted, offering better security. The radio frequency could be used much more efficiently, letting network providers sign many more people up for the service. This was also where cell phones were first starting to get screens, opening the door to other services including text messages as teens everywhere started giving their thumbs a workout. Cell phones started entering the mainstream, and the most common model was a bulky, durable phone that was only half the size of the 1G models. These models were so durable that many can still be turned on today, even if the service is long disconnected. 
A few networks still exist around the world, but the cell phone world is marching ahead. Cell phones were getting closer to what we know today, but more than one quantum leap was still to come. It was almost the dawning of a new millennium, and cellular experts were hard at work developing the next big advancement in mobile phones. The first test of a 3G network came in 1998 in Japan, but in 2001 it was available for purchase and soon spread around the world. The cell phones using 3G were much more powerful, and they came with many more functions. Not only could you talk or text with a much better connection, but you can now connect to the internet. Many phones in this era were still flip phones with limited capacity, but this was the dawning of the newest innovation in cell phones, the smartphone. Whether you're using an iPhone or an Android, it's easy to forget that you're even carrying a cell phone. It does so much it's like a portable little computer in your pocket. People use it to surf the internet, make video calls or film videos, and even watch TV during their commute. 3G services are still available around the world, but becoming less and less common. 3G sounds great, so why do we need more? Just wait and see. It wasn't long into 3G's life that the experts were already looking forward, and by 2007, major telecom businesses were testing their 4G networks. Now cell towers went up around the world, and new cell phones were put out in 2008 with 4G capabilities. What started as an expensive luxury item quickly became a mainstream choice, and people were blown away by what their new cell phones could do. Streaming content became easier than ever, and major studios started gearing original content to be played on cell phones. Applications like Skype and Zoom made it possible not just to talk to someone over video across the world, but to talk to multiple people in a video meeting. Maybe the biggest shift for 4G was just how fast the network was. People using 3G networks for teleconferencing would frequently experience lags and dropped calls, often right when you were explaining your big pitch to the boss. With 4G, that became less common, and the speed and reliability of the powerful network opened the door to a whole new industry, video game streaming. Gamers would play high-intensity co-op games live, often competing for money against players from around the world. The cell phone became more powerful and more reliable than most people's desktop computers, with cell phone service being a better bet than cable internet. Now the vast majority of cell phone users around the world use a 4G network. So what's 5G and why is it needed? What technology is still waiting for us when the next innovation comes? Part of the reason 5G is so critical is capacity. The cell phone has become a necessary part of everyday life, with people being constantly connected to everyone around the world and using it to do their jobs, get directions, order food and transportation, and play games. There's also the added element of the Internet of Things, where more household devices are becoming connected to the internet for better functionality. That lets people do things like look up recipes on their devices, but it also provides some unique opportunities. When a teenage girl was grounded in 2019, her mother took away all her electronics, but she was determined to keep her Twitter account updated. She tweeted on her phone and her video game systems until they were also taken away. So she talked to her parents' smart fridge and sent a tweet from there. The sheer number of connections out there puts an enormous strain on the current 4G networks, and the only way to overcome that and keep everyone connected smoothly is to create a bigger, better network. To maximize the effectiveness of 5G networks in development around the world, they're going to use higher frequency radio waves to increase speed. But high frequency radio waves have a shorter range, and as such, their cell network range will be smaller. So 5G networks will have three different frequency bands, small, medium, and high. It'll be three different cell phone networks working as one, balancing the trade-off of download and streaming speed versus greater distance and range. Whatever is the highest speed antenna available in your range, that's what the cell phone will connect to. So what will you be able to do with your new 5G equipped cell phone? 5G networks will offer the highest download speed ever available, commercially up to 10 gigabits per second. The network will be so powerful that it's likely many telecom providers like Apple and Microsoft will eventually look into converting their laptops and desktop computers to be 5G capable, replacing traditional connections and Wi-Fi. We'll be living in a world of cellular technology, and it'll be easier to control your entire network of internet-capable devices wherever you are. Worried you left the stove on when you left the house? No more. Log into your smart stove from your cell phone and check if it's on, and turn it off remotely if it is. The rollout of 5G is still going on around the world, but lucky first customers are getting to test out the new network on their mobile devices. It hasn't reached its full capacity yet, but those who like to get their hands on the newest technology first are happy to give it a try, and most are bowled over by the speeds despite the usual troubleshooting of new tech. Despite the network's power, many people are concerned about 5G. So concerned, in fact, 
that it's become one of the biggest controversies today. So what makes this network different from the ones before it, and why are people so angry? Well, the first complaint is simple. It's going to be expensive to get on board. 4G devices, the vast majority of devices available today, aren't going to be able to access 5G networks. That means that if you want the best network available, it's time to pony up for a new cell phone or tablet, or bug the parents until they buy it. 5G-capable smartphones aren't going to be cheap, and that makes a lot of people pretty angry that their perfectly good 4G phone just became obsolete. But this is nothing new. To access new networks, people have almost always needed a device that can access them. What's changed is that technology is marching forward so fast that the gap between generations is getting smaller. But could 5G be a problem in other ways? To the environment or even to us? Many environmentalists have expressed concern about these powerful electromagnetic networks and their impact on the air and public safety. One area of particular concern is weather tracking satellites. The satellites will pick up the powerful radio waves, which could cause a reduction in accuracy, especially for tracking water vapor concentration. This is critical in helping cities plan for major storms, and many military and meteorological groups have urged those building the networks to limit their capacity to prevent damage to the existing data gathering networks. Another major concern centers around the low intensity radiation emitted from cellular devices. Many people have alleged in the past that the constant presence presence of a cell phone near the head could cause an increase in brain cancer. But studies have not shown any increase in frequency of cancers among cell phone users and that any radiation emitted by cell phones is below the limits recommended to ensure safety. But is there something different about 5G networks that could tip the balance into being harmful? A lot of people think so. Around the world, people spread rumors that 5G towers being built would endanger the health of the people around them. Allegations ranged from everything to increased radiation that would cause cancer to the radio frequencies making it harder to sleep or concentrate. Parents attributed their children's change in behavior to the towers. Rumors even started that the coronavirus sweeping the globe was actually being caused by the 5G towers. But that's just some people talking on the internet, right? Wrong. The theories about 5G being harmful spread so far and fast that arson attacks against the infrastructure occurred around Europe. And it wasn't just anonymous protesters. The brother of the former head of Britain's Labour Party led one of the protests himself. The concerns grew and politicians heard from their constituents, and some took action. The cities of Brussels and Geneva put a hold on 5G development due to concerns, and a group of 180 scientists wrote the European Union asking for a pause on future 5G installations. In the United States, a city in California blocked the installation, and Vermont and New Hampshire had a raucous town hall before installations were allowed. So what's the evidence driving these concerns? While some evidence exists, including people showing varied symptoms of a condition called electromagnetic hypersensitivity, the majority of evidence shows 5G frequencies are not the cause of health conditions. Most scientists say that 5G is safe, but that hasn't stopped the theories that put it as the cause for everything under the sun. The conspiracy is largely spread by news outlets known for their conspiracy theories, and multiple celebrities have spread it to their army of social media followers. On the other side, the vast majority of electronics experts and public health experts, news outlets like Reuters and USA Today, and the executive director of the American Public Health Association, they clarified that 5G mobile phone networks are not harmful to public health and assured people that there's definitely not any way for the virus to transmit themselves over radio waves. More people are starting to push back against the idea that 5G is harmful, with YouTube removing content alleging the conspiracy. The problem is, once something's on the internet, it's very hard to remove. All it takes is one person to see the theory and share it to their followers, and it's spreading, like a virus. Ironically, many of those spreading the idea that 5G is dangerous with no proof may be using 5G devices. But for most people, 5G networks are going to be the ticket to faster internet, greater synchronicity with all their devices, and the ability to connect with people around the world without any glitches. It'll be around the world soon, albeit with more guards to make sure no one tears down the poles. But the odds are some scientist in a telecom lab somewhere is working on the research that will be the first step to 6G. And we all know that 6G without a doubt transmits the super coronavirus at the Illuminati's behest, of course. It's a clear August night. You're stargazing in the middle of the Nevada desert with a bunch of friends. Suddenly an unidentified flying object streaks across the sky. The UFO is silent, but clearly moving faster than the speed of sound. Was that a shooting star, one of your friends asks? No, it was definitely some sort of aircraft, says another. Everyone turns their telescope in the direction of the UFO, but it's gone. 
Then one of your friends says, I know what it was. It was a military aircraft that's using alien technology from Area 51. Everyone laughs, but your friend insists that the military has been using alien secrets for decades. A couple of people snicker, but others sit quietly with shifting eyes. Area 51 is probably the most infamous site connected to alien technology. The high security military base did not appear on any public maps for decades, and even after that, the United States government refused to admit it existed. This obviously created conspiracy theories and intrigue over what was happening at the secret base. The fact that the world's most advanced airplanes, such as the U-2 spy plane, were all developed there only adds fuel to the conspiracy theory fire. We know that something secretive is already going on at Area 51. The government has always been adamant about keeping the civilian population out. It has been suggested that the U-2 was based off of technology recovered from an alien spacecraft. The UFO allegedly crash-landed at the location in the Nevada desert where Area 51 is now. At the time of the crash, the US military needed an aircraft that could fly over 70,000 feet and take pictures of Soviet installations and secrets. No other plane had been able to achieve this altitude and speed until the U-2 came along. Your friend suggests that the only reason the US military ended up with a plane that suited their needs was because they stole the technology from the alien spacecraft that had crashed. Also, the U-2 required a never-before-produced fuel that would not evaporate at high altitudes. Are we just supposed to believe that the Shell Oil Company magically produced the new fuel at the same time as the state-of-the-art aircraft, your friend asks? Aliens must have played a role in the development of the U-2 project, or at least alien secrets were stolen to make it a success. Your friend argues that the leap in technological advancements in the decade following World War II just couldn't have happened without alien intervention. How could US engineers and scientists make such big strides without a little help from our friends upstairs, he asks. The rest of the group seems a little skeptical that the U-2 was based off of stolen alien secrets, although it did come out of Area 51, so is it really that crazy of an idea? Another member of the group speaks up. I don't know about the U-2, but the A-12 Archangel and the SR-71 Blackbird were definitely built using alien technology. You and your friends turn to listen to the new speaker. She lays out why she believes the A-12 and the SR-71 are aircraft that were built using alien technology. The unique body shape of those aircrafts alone could have been stolen from alien spacecraft. These aircrafts had a longer fuselage than any other military plane at that point in time. Their distinctive cobra-like appearance could only be concocted by the minds of aliens. Not only that, but the first A-12 arrived at Area 51 in a specially designed secret trailer. She explains that the trailer itself is suspicious, but what was inside may be even more incredible. Did the trailers contain alien technology that was incorporated into the aircraft? She continues explaining how if the US really wanted to hide the plane from the Soviets, they could have just designed and built the whole thing at Area 51. Instead, the A-12 was brought in specially designed trailers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each. That's a lot of money just to spend on transportation, unless you're transporting something that could change the world. She believes, like others, that the trailers were made to hide alien technology, which would be incorporated into the A-12 and SR-71. The SR-71 and its predecessor could reach a sustained speed of Mach 3.2 at 90,000 feet of altitude. This blew any previous US aircraft out of the water. Your friend is convinced that there must have been stolen alien technology used to improve the A-12 so substantially over the U-2. It could fly 2,000 miles per hour faster, for goodness sakes, she yells. You shake your head and look back up at the stars. Could they be right? No way. Aliens haven't visited Earth. At least you don't think they have. Then the person next to you clears their throat. <clears throat> as much as I want to agree with you two, I don't know if there's quite enough evidence for me to be convinced that alien technology was used in the U-2, A-12, and SR-71 aircraft. You're about to agree with him when he suddenly says, but the F-117 Nighthawk was without a doubt made from alien technology. Let me tell you all about it. Up until this point in time, aircraft could all be seen by radar in one form or another. There was no such thing as stealth aircraft. Then the Nighthawk was designed at Area 51. The knowledge and engineering skills used to create such an advanced technology must have been based on something. Your friend suggests that stealth technology was just stolen alien technology. It had never been done on Earth before, so maybe it came from beyond the planet. The sleek angles could have been based off a crashed alien spacecraft. Perhaps this very technology was why alien UFOs were so hard to find and track. All the aliens were using it to stealthily fly around our planet. He continues talking excitedly. Do you mean to tell me that the boomerang shape of UFOs dating back as far as the 1940s was designed by humans for the Nighthawk? Absolutely not. It doesn't add up. The design of the aircraft must have come from the designs of a crashed alien spacecraft. There's no way that the US military just came up with the body design and stealth technology for the F-117 off the top of their heads. He's adamant that the Nighthawk is made from stolen alien tech. 
Your friend finishes his explanation, crosses his arms, and sits back in his chair. I bet that's hard to argue against, he says with a smirk. All of your stargazing friends really seem to be into alien conspiracies, but you're still a skeptic. Isn't it just possible that the US had really good scientists and engineers who came up with all the ideas, you ask? Sure, another stargazer across from you says, as they look through their telescope. But if that were the case, how do you explain the new Chinese helicopter called the Super Great White Shark? You haven't heard of this craft before and wait for the explanation. The stargazer pulls away from the telescope, rubs their eyes, and tells the group about the Super Great White Shark that was designed using alien technology. They pull up a picture on their phone. Sure enough, looks just like a classic flying saucer. The Chinese claim that the helicopter was designed to fight in the digital information battlefield of the future. It has a blended wing design that's the same technology used in the United States B-2 bomber. They explain that this technology must have been stolen from a common source, aliens. The US and the Chinese developing highly sophisticated stealth technology around the same time is unlikely. The stealth tech had to have a connection somewhere. They argue that the US and China have never been too friendly, so collaboration is unlikely. Therefore, they must have a common source of information for new technology. That common source is none other than aliens. The stargazer shoves the picture in your face again. The glow of the smartphone screen blinds you for a moment. Look at the shape, they yell. You have to give credit. The shape of the Super Great White Shark helicopter is very similar to a flying saucer. Could this new Chinese aircraft be based off of the spaceships of extraterrestrials? You're not sure you're convinced, but you do wonder how far back you'd have to go before people started attributing advanced military tech to aliens. Then, as if one of your other friends is reading your mind, they blurt out, It was the Nazis! Everyone looks at them. What? You all ask at once. You all may be right about this alien technology in different aircraft, but stolen alien tech was first used by the Nazis, he says. You sit back and get ready for the biggest surprise of the night. The use of alien technologies by Nazi Germany went something like this, your friend says. In 1936, there were accounts of a saucer-shaped ship crashing in Germany. It was claimed to have dead extraterrestrial beings inside. The SS recovered it within hours and used reverse engineering out of the alien technology to make weapons. Hitler and the Nazis were obsessed with the occult, so they may have found other alien technology around the world as they spread like a disease across the continents. The first stolen alien technology used by the Nazis was in their rockets. Your friend carries on with their alien history lesson. The V-1 buzz bomber and the V-2 rocket were light years ahead of their time. Nothing even close had ever been created in human history. The sheer complexity of the rockets compared to weapons that had previously been invented was mind-boggling. It's clear evidence that alien technology was being used. Some conspiracy theorists believe that alien technology went as far as allowing the Nazis to develop missiles that could reach New York and Mars. The Nazis stole alien technology and used it to try and conquer the world, your friend shouts. But that's not all. The Nazis may have discovered fission with the help of reversed-engineered alien technology. Luckily, the aliens that the Nazis had found were already dead, otherwise they might have been able to get even more alien secrets out of them. One Nazi technology that's definitely from aliens was the Hanebu. The aircraft has been shown by skeptics to be made up, but I know it was for real, your friend says. It was an actual flying saucer designed by the Nazis. Can anyone really deny that Hitler and the Nazis would do something as crazy as building their own flying saucer? Not really, you mutter under your breath. You look around to your friend group. You're still a skeptic, but their ideas have given you at least something to think about. A lot of revolutionary technology was discovered and built during World War II. The decades that followed also consisted of a boom of innovation in the tech world. Could it be possible that this influx of new technology was because of the acquisition of stolen alien secrets? It's that time again when your local McDonald's puts its famous McRib sandwich on the menu. A magical meal of mushed up mystery meat. An imposter of sorts pretending to be something it's not. The McRib might just be a nutritional nightmare. And sure, it might be a bad actor in a terrible B-movie that arguably should never have been made. But it has history, and that's important. It might even have saved lives. So the next time you find yourself biting into one of these pioneering pieces of peculiar pork, this video should be on your mind. Let's start with the basics, though, before we get to the mostly unknown genesis of the marvelous McRib. When you're eating food, especially meat products, there's one word that doesn't exactly shout healthy. That word is reconstructed. In short, it means making a foodstuff look like a different foodstuff. What you're getting is a fake, a pretender, an imposter. The McRib is about as far away from being meat-lined bones that have been taken from a pig as what Disney World Space Mountain roller coaster is to actually flying through space. It's a simulation burger, a pseudo-rib, containing large doses of salt, sugar, and saturated fat. It's no coincidence that people who starred in My 600-Pound Life did a lot of their shopping at McDonald's. 
In high doses, the McRib can cause obesity, America's favorite national problem. It's packed with un-goodness. That's a word we just invented because it fits so well with the McDonald's menu. And if you commit yourself to some cursory research, you can find that McRib ribs are not ribs or even rib meat. They have nothing to do with ribs, they're merely ribby. They are primarily composed of ground pork shoulder. It's just too expensive for a capitalist powerhouse like McDonald's to use all decent quality meat. Don't forget this, it's a matter of great importance today. The McRib was designed not only to trick you but also to save on pennies. So with that in mind, a better name for the McRib would be the McThing. Here's a definition of the McThing. Restructured meat products are commonly manufactured by using lower-valued meat trimmings, reduced in size by comminution, flaking, chunking, grinding, chopping, or slicing. The comminuted meat mixture is mixed with salt and water to extract salt-soluble proteins. It's the proteins that act as the glue to make the thing stick together. But we know that what you're interested in is the lower-valued meat trimmings part. This is generally kept secret from the consumer, so when you get some heart or eye with your hot dog, the package will just say something like, meat products. Always be wary of the terrifying vagueness of a meat product. It could be a bull's John Thomas, a sheep's Ding Dongs, a chicken's eyeball. If you're getting a meat product, you can almost guarantee it consists of some unsavory animal parts. If you eat a McRib, you could be enjoying the taste of an animal's heart, tripe, or a scalded stomach. If you don't know already, tripe comes from the lining of an animal's stomach. It's a delicacy in some places and waste in others. Before the McRib made its first appearance on McDonald's menus in 1981, it was the brainchild of a successful chef. His name was René Arendt, a cook from Luxembourg who ended up working in Chicago with one of the most respected chefs in the world. Yep, a gourmet chef invented the McRib. Go figure. Arendt was first in his class at the renowned college technique Hotelier de Strasbourg. He could have gone anywhere after that, from restaurants where a bottle of wine costs more than the dishwasher's yearly wage, to your local Five Guys. He did go places too. He made dishes for Queen Elizabeth, the King of Belgium, and the Italian actress Sophia Loren, none of whom you could imagine wolfing down a plate of tripe and vinegar. But then, in the 1970s, Ray Kroc, the man who made McDonald's the global phenomenon it is today, made Arendt an offer he couldn't refuse. When Arendt was offered the job, his initial reply was, I'm not a hamburger man, I am a chef. We are completely different. But that's exactly what Kroc wanted. Selling the people of the United States waste meat products would look a lot better if the man behind them was an up-and-coming top-shelf chef. Make no mistake, when a new product came out, McDonald's let people know its creator had once cooked for the queen. So, for more money, Arendt quit working in the kitchens of gourmet chefs and went to work at a place where the red-haired clown seduced kids into happily embracing the promise of adulthood diabetes. When Aaron started in the late 70s, he was trying to come up with a dish to make McDonald's even more popular. The restaurant had gotten incredibly popular over a short period of time. In the US alone, it was serving around 17 million customers every day. But more needed to be done. Aaron knew he needed something that could be made really fast at a low cost. This is why he came up with the Chicken McNugget. It took him and his team another three months just to find a suitable source for the ingredients. McNuggets were an instant hit. In fact, soon McDonald's had to construct three new processing plants for the hit dish. This is where everyday people would sit on a production line, taking chicken bones out from already processed chickens. When Arendt was asking what was happening to all the other parts of the chicken once they had the meatiest bits picked off, he replied, from chicken, nothing is lost. This is what he was good at using every part of the animal and somehow making the final product taste okay. He had help, though, for the science part of the creations. When you're making heavily processed food, you need scientists just as much as you need someone's culinary skills. The scientist in this case was named Roger Mandigo. His name now sits in the Meat Industry Hall of Fame. Yeah, that actually exists. One of the reasons why Mandigo reached such heady heights in the business of murdering animals was because he was a pioneer in the process we told you about reconstructing meaty things. He once famously explained how he managed to get regular folks to eat mystery meat. Most people would be extremely unhappy if they were served heart or tongue on a plate, but flaked into a restructured product that it loses its identity. Such products as tripe, heart, and scalded stomachs are high in protein, completely edible, wholesome, and nutritious, and most are already used in sausage without objection. Arendt once explained why he and Mandigo started working together on the McRib. There wasn't a system to supply enough chicken, so we had to come up with something to give the other franchises a new product. So the McRib came about because of the shortage of chickens. 
He said he got the idea when he visited some of the poorer parts of the USA South, where he said he saw folks barbecuing the cheapest cuts of pork and smothering them with sauce. The McRib was almost immediately a big hit. McDonald's started making even more money in an era where it was basically already printing its own banknotes. But then the McRib craze suddenly stopped. Customers seemed to go off the McRib really quickly. The socio-psychological reason is that the McRib is a niche product. It has a bit of a cult following, but people usually enjoy something different only so many times. They usually go back to beef in the end. Another reason why McDonald's only puts it on the menu every now and again is because pork trimmings can be hard to get your hands on, unlike beef trimmings. And if McDonald's buys lots of hard-to-get pork trimmings, their price starts to shoot up. Selling the McRib as a novelty item solved the problem. McDonald's also created a buzz around the meal, telling folks their special pork dish is back. This doesn't happen in Germany, though, where the McRib is sold all year round. Savages. Avid consumers of the McRib probably don't know there are about 70 ingredients in one 500-calorie McRib. One of the ingredients is the additive azodicarbonamide, aka the yoga mat chemical. It's nicknamed that because it's often used to make foamed plastic things. It's actually used for the bun to keep the bun looking… uh… bunny. Many fast food restaurants use it in their buns. There are plenty of other additives in the McRib, although in Europe and Australia they won't allow companies to use azodicarbonamide as a food additive. Over there, they don't like mixing their yoga mats with their edibles. They say azodicarbonamide might cause respiratory problems such as asthma. When a restaurant has to stack something with ample additives, flavorings, and addictive properties such as sugar, it's because the raw product would taste like hell. Fast food was never just about getting food to customers fast but more about giving millions and millions of people something cheap that didn't taste too bad. The McRib is to sandwiches what homemade fentanyl is to pure opium. With all that in mind, where do you think something like the McRib would be useful? Answer: On the battlefield. During the Second World War, it wasn't easy to get fresh meat to soldiers, or for that matter, much of the poorer public. Meat was a luxury. This is why another wonder of the mystery meat world really took off that was the meat product we call Spam. So when talking about the evolution of the McRib, we can go a bit farther back. Then when Monsieur Arend and Mr. Mandigo were helping McDonald's make a killing out of nothing goes to waste pigs. In the 1960s, the Natick Soldier Center for Research and Development in the US was thinking about how to feed American soldiers when they were on missions. They needed something nutritional but cheap. And this is why they came up with MREs, Meals Ready to Eat. They apparently don't taste too bad. On a forum, a former soldier was asked what MREs were like. This was his reply. In all honesty, they taste a lot like cheap canned foods. Think canned spaghetti, spam, Vienna sausages, etc. If you want the experience tonight, go get a can of spaghetti and meatballs. Eat it cold with some stale saltines. Don't skimp on the Tabasco. Another soldier said the taste is sometimes the last thing you think about when you've been walking all day with a heavy load on your back. He said you simply need the calories. The meals are not supposed to titillate your palate. They're made just to be edible. When it comes to MREs, the nutritional value is important and that's a good thing because often the parts of the animal that many people don't like to eat, the intestines and the internal organs, pack loads of nutrients. This is why the Natick Soldier Center for Research and Development got in touch with a food production company in Ohio and asked them if they could buy all the unwanted meat mush. They then turned it into something that looked like a burger and the soldiers might have thought they were eating a regular burger when in fact they were munching on stuff they probably would throw away if they were butchering an animal at home. Then the center went a step further and asked the meat packing factories to turn the mush into nice shapes to make the mystery meat look more presentable. Hey, presto! The military soon started saving a ton of cash and soldiers thought they were getting burgers, albeit ones that came in a can or a bag. By the 1970s, soldiers were getting reconstructed lamb chops, pork chops, veal steaks, and beef steaks. So when commercial entities started seeing imposter meat products being made by the army from what used to be waste, they started doing the same. All they had to do was make the thing look real and add so many additives, preservatives, and flavorings that it lasted a long time and tasted all right. McDonald's copied the army's recipe almost to a T. Mandico admitted to this, saying the military allowed us to use the processes they developed. This is why we can say the US Army actually pioneered the McRib. 
Army rations even include them now, as part of what one journalist jokingly said was the McRib Industrial Complex. A journalist writing for US Veterans Magazine got his hands on one, although it was described on the packet as rib-shaped barbecue-flavored pork patty. He opened it up and had a taste. His short review went like this. The pebbly textured meat is caramel brown and crossed by four raised bones. Not unappealing, except if you peek in the package. The meat juice is a bizarrely bright yellowish orange. I quickly tilt the pouch to keep from splashing out. I slice off an end with a knife and a fork. It's porky and slightly smoky, although there is a tinny aftertaste, probably from some of the preservatives used to keep it fresh so long. He proceeded to embellish the strange dish with relish and wrote, Not bad. Scatter a couple of onion slices and pickles on top, and the whole thing would be pretty damn close to a McRib. So, the next time you bite into a McRib, just remember that you're doing what soldiers did in the deserts of Afghanistan and the jungles of Southeast Asia. As for why you'd pay good money for this dish of deviance in the safety of your hometown, well, you tell us why you do something so bloody reckless. Roombas and wheeled hoverboards are a long way from the robot maids and flying hoverboards of sci-fi hits such as The Jetsons and Back to the Future. But while some technologies seem like very cheap versions of what science fiction has promised us, there are other technologies available today that are pretty close to the real deal and are absolutely incredible. Welcome to this episode of The Infographic Show, amazing technologies you didn't know already exist. First up is something every smartphone user is sure to be ecstatic about. Back when Apple released its iPhone 6, consumers quickly discovered that the phone was very prone to bending. Most new owners, who couldn't figure out if it was a feature meant to reduce the risk of damage, quickly discovered it was a design flaw. When their iPhone bent too far, they were left with a very expensive paperweight. But researchers around the world have been developing flexible screens for the last decade, and it seems like everything from flexible computers, TV screens, and phones to tablets you can roll up, fold, and bend like a newspaper are about to hit the market. A company called Lenovo is already working on the first flexible phone, which they envision will be worn like a bracelet and can be flattened out straight. Display manufacturer Visionox recently unveiled a foldable television computer display at the Society for Information Displays conference this year in Los Angeles. In fact, flexible displays have been around for a while, so why aren't they in your pocket yet? Currently, the problem with flexible displays is that they still require non-flexible hardware such as batteries, antennas, and cases. Basically, all the guts of your device can't be made to bend and fold without breaking it. But if we got this far, it's just a matter of time before advances in material science will allow us to move to the next step and pretty soon you might be able to fold your 60-inch TV screen into your backpack. Back to the Future showed a lot of promising technology when it came out in the 80s, but the one everyone thinks of the moment they hear the name Marty McFly is the hoverboard. While we've recently gotten wheeled, self-balancing hoverboards, they're a far cry from the fast, frictionless, levitating hoverboard of Back to the Future. But fret not, because hover technology is finally here. The Hendo Hover uses electromagnetic energy in a way similar to Japan's famed bullet trains. Opposing magnetic fields push the hoverboard up and let a user hover above the ground. Unfortunately, that means you can't use this hoverboard anywhere but on special surfaces built specifically for the device as it requires a strong magnetic field to repel against. Omni hoverboards, meanwhile, use technology similar to the one used for the hoverboard of Spider-Man's Green Goblin. Their hoverboards consist of a system of four propellers that rotate at incredible speed and thus generate lift that is similar to a miniature helicopter. While these propeller-driven boards can achieve speeds of up to 25 miles per hour, brand new jet-powered hoverboards can reach speeds up to 93 miles per hour and heights of up to 10,000 feet. With computer-aided stability assist similar to some fighter planes, jet hoverboards promise to take the burgeoning sport of hoverboarding to incredible new heights and speeds. Most people are familiar with Siri and Alexa, but did you know that physical robots are poised to become a big part of our everyday lives? Robots have already invaded hotels around the world. For example, the Aloft Cupertino in, where else, Silicon Valley, is the first hotel in the US to feature a robot housekeeper of sorts. Nicknamed Bottler, the three-foot-tall robot makes deliveries for guests across the hotel, bringing them toiletry items, bottled water, microwave popcorn, and even coloring books for kids. Other hotels have been quick to follow suit, with robotic assistants being tasked with everything from mail delivery to room service requests, luggage handling, and more. 
And while most people know someone with a Roomba already, have you heard of its big brother, the Robomo? Basically an oversized Roomba, the Robomo keeps yards trimmed up neatly and can even collect the trimmings for easy disposal. For inside the home, there's the Litter Robot, a self-cleaning cat porta potty that keeps the litter box clean, and if your clothing stinks because of pet smells, there's the Swash, a miniaturized dry cleaner that can wash and keep your delicate clothing items clean and wrinkle-free. Robots aren't just limited to the home, however. Construction sites around the world are adopting automatic bricklayers that can lay 3,000 bricks in one eight-hour shift without taking a single break. And in the realm of security, robots are already making a big appearance, most notably with the Nightscape series of robotic security guards being deployed around the country. While not meant to actually arrest any offenders, the 300-pound robots are meant to act as a deterrent to crime by monitoring and recording would-be trespassers. By most accounts, they seem to be a success, even if prone to the occasional bug, such as one robot that accidentally drowned itself in a Washington, D.C. fountain. Google Glass promised a lot, an augmented reality experience that would let users superimpose the internet over real life. But in the end, it delivered on very little. Yet the world of wearable technology has pressed on, with smart contact lenses soon coming to market. While many manufacturers dream of a Google Glass-like experience in contact lens form, that technology is still likely years away. Instead, scientists are developing contact lenses that can monitor a patient's vital signs without invasive probes or needles and can even relay that information wirelessly over the internet. At the moment, Google, Novartis, and a handful of independent researchers are all working on lenses that can monitor a diabetes patient's glucose levels by measuring the sugar content in their tears. Initial results are very promising, and some animal trials have already been successfully completed, but the lenses are for the moment still in the trial phase. If manufacturers can make a wearable device that fits in your eye, it won't be long before we might see Google Glass's promise come to life in a much more compact form. Ever wonder what your dog is thinking? New brain monitoring technology might be able to not only tell you its thoughts, but also actually let your dog speak for itself. No More Wolf, an independent manufacturer, is busy developing a brain scanning wearable device that detects your dog's unique brain activity and translates what it is thinking. While the device can't decipher specific thoughts, it can translate general ideas by closely monitoring electronic activity in the brain and then voicing them electronically, making it possible for your dog to communicate things such as I'm tired or I'm hungry. A $1,200 version of the wearable device even promises to learn your dog's unique thought patterns over time and eventually develop the ability to translate short sentences such as I'm hungry or I don't like this. Still in development, the company behind the wearable device hopes to push the technology even further to enable more complex communication, even allowing your dog to understand your thoughts. Cooking can be a tedious and time-consuming task, especially in today's high-speed lifestyle. However, while most people are familiar with 3D printers by now, did you know that food printers exist as well? Surprisingly, very few manufacturers thought to export their 3D printing technology into the realm of food, giving a very big business opportunity to the Spanish company Natural Machines. While mostly for high-end restaurants such as Michelin star winners, its food printers have repeatedly sold out and the company is promising new, more home-centered models in the near future. Maybe robot chefs will replace the need for food printers altogether. In 2014, Moly Robotics unveiled a robotic chef made up of two robotic arms attached to a specialized stovetop. By carefully monitoring and mapping the movement of world-class chefs with 3D cameras, the robotic arms can perfectly reproduce a top chef's technique and make delicious meals from scratch. Made up of 20 motors, two dozen joints, and 129 sensors, the robotic arms and hands can power through cooking tasks very quickly, but they are designed to move very slowly so as not to alarm any humans who may be watching it at work. However, with prices around $15,000, this robotic chef will remain out of most people's homes for the time being. Sometime in the not-too-distant future, a robot crushes a human skull underfoot as it scours the landscape for more people to kill. Overhead, heavily armed drones hunt out the last human survivors, mercilessly pushing the human race into extinction. And in a shining metal facility somewhere deep in the desert, a mastermind artificial intelligence fires the last few remaining human nuclear weapons back down onto the people who created them. Any human survivors are rounded up by the machines and sent to prison camps where they're forced to compute Pi for eternity. We've all seen these horrible visions of the future. And while this has been fantasy for many decades, today we're moving closer than ever to a man-made machine apocalypse with modern nations like Russia leading the way. 
Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at autonomous military killer robots and how they might be the future of the Russian and other nations' armies. First of all, why build a killer robot in the first place? Well, the simplest answer is that as humans we are generally adverse to taking any unnecessary risks, and as an act of altruism we seek to limit the amount of danger that we place our own soldiers in. A drone can do many of the things human soldiers can, and if the drone gets killed then there's no loss of human life. Politically though, this is an incredibly appealing option for generals and politicians alike, as losing human lives in combat can have severely negative repercussions with the civilian population. In nations such as the US and Great Britain, which rely completely on a volunteer military, this is an especially important consideration, as low public opinion of the military directly correlates with less and less quality recruits. Russia, of which approximately two-thirds of its military are still conscripts, is slowly trying to shift to an all-volunteer service, something it has difficulty doing because of the low appeal that the military has as a viable career option. In fact, even its mandatory conscription policies are proving difficult to implement in recent years, with up to 164,000 young men in Russia avoiding their draft notices in 2018. Military service is overwhelmingly an unappealing option for Russian men. For example, in the US a service member can enlist with a sign-on bonus and leave the military expecting access to medical care with a very generous education benefits package that includes tens of thousands of dollars for school, supplies, and basic allowance for housing to cover food and rent. A Russian service member's benefits, however, are limited to preferred entry status to universities, which allows them to replace the entry exams required with an interview. They must still pay for their own education and can expect no help at all with paying for housing, medical care, or supplies. While Russia has been slowly trying to make volunteer service more appealing, its military budget simply can't afford to offer the same benefits as the US, and thus it continues to struggle to create a completely volunteer military force. With low morale, nearly zero retention, and low quality, conscripts are a universally unappealing option for any military, let alone a Russian military trying to maintain its competitive edge against Western militaries. This is where armed drones are suddenly a very appealing option for the Russian military. With no need to maintain their morale, no expensive benefits to pay out after the end of their service, and no impact on public opinion, armed drones seem like the perfect answer to the Russian military's personnel retention problems and lack of a fully volunteer military force. Simply put, the Russian military can avoid the hassle of a manned workforce altogether by simply replacing soldiers with robots who don't need salaries or enticing benefit packages. Drones also don't require much in the way of supply costs, certainly far less than the housing, medical care, and feeding costs of a human soldier, and they completely eliminate the greatest cost of manned military altogether, the cost of training. To recruit a new marine, the United States spends $6,539 per marine in recruitment costs alone which include the cost of advertisement, college funds, and an enlistment bonus. But then you have to train that new recruit, which adds $1,614 in uniforms and gear, with $301 in classroom training costs. Unsurprisingly, the lowest classroom training costs of any branch of the US military. Then there's annual salary as well as clothing and moving expenses, which tack on an additional $19,973. Ammunition costs for training and kitting out add up to $787, and support staff to include drill sergeants and teachers add an additional $15,674. In just his first year alone, a brand new marine recruit costs the US government $44,887. Over a four-year service contract, you can expect that cost to come to an average of $180,000. And that's before figuring out pay increases and additional training costs, which realistically push the figure closer to 300,000. Yet these figures are only for a basic infantry grunt, and with modern militaries requiring ever more technologically proficient service members to do more high-tech jobs, costs are skyrocketing. The cost of graduating a single recruit from a military academy is on average $340,000, and that's before receiving their military training. Compare those costs with the $10,000 cost for a small unmanned ground vehicle, such as a robotic mule, and $100,000 on average for a larger model such as a platform capable of delivering ground fire support, and you start to see why robots are an incredibly appealing option for any military, but especially for the Russian armed forces. Yet for Russia, robots are a very appealing option for another much more practical reason, and that's their power as a force multiplier. 
A force multiplier is any strategy or equipment which has a multiplicative effect on the effectiveness of your military forces. On a tactical level, it can be as simple as a strategically advantageous defensive position, and on a macro level, it can be advanced warfighting concepts such as combined arms warfare. Anything that directly increases the lethality of your military forces is a force multiplier. Currently, Russia finds itself in a very unfavorable strategic position. NATO countries push up against its doorstep, and Western economies continue to outstrip it both in the financial sector and the technology and development sectors. The more powerful economies in the West are increasingly more appealing for Russian nationals with advanced technical training, who may prefer to seek out higher salaries in other countries. This has led to a brain drain across the Russian economy, further impacting its ability to innovate and expand. While Russia continues to develop cutting-edge military technologies, it very often finds itself unable to actually field those technologies due to their cost. This is more apparent in the official cancellation of Russia's fifth-generation fighter program, which, after years of development, was abruptly placed on indeterminate hiatus. Ground robots offer many favorable solutions to Russia's growing military quandary, providing Russia with a cheap option for bolstering its military forces. While Russia's generals, as any other nation's generals would do, dream of completely overpowering any potential enemies, the strategic truth behind Russia's military doctrine has for decades been not to defeat NATO, but to offer them only extremely unfavorable win conditions. Armed ground robots can directly aid in this vision by offering Russia a cheap, mass-producible fighting force that can be rushed into any potential conflict, immune to fear, low morale, or mass desertion. As is feared from Russia's conscript force in a real war, ground robots seem the perfect tool, and when fielded in large numbers can help bring a numerological parity of sorts versus NATO troops. Yet, ground robots come with a host of moral issues, and thanks to the US, the use of drones generates serious negative public opinion around the world. Blamed for using drones to indiscriminately kill civilians along with their military targets, the US military has fought a fierce public opinion war to defend its use of drones. Russia would face a similar problem if it were to begin the use of combat ground drones, though it would quickly discover the public backlash to be exponentially magnified. While American aerial drones strike surgically at individual targets, Russia's ambition to field a large force of ground robots would place these robots on the front lines of combat, exposing them to far more civilian casualties than individual drone loitering far behind enemy lines and seeking out one specific target. Ground robots, or their operators, would face the difficulty of executing a ground war on the front lines against enemy combat forces, while also navigating the hordes of civilians inevitably caught in the crossfire of modern urban combat operations. While any military faces this quandary, Russia's troubles in this regard are especially significant. Because of its desire to field ground robots in numbers significant enough to deter NATO's traditional armed forces, though historically, Russia has not given much concern to the collateral damage of their military operations. Currently, Russia has several ground robots in development to fulfill a variety of duties, but the most prominent models are those of the Marker family of large remotely operated drones. The size of a small tank, Marker robots can be outfitted with a variety of weapon systems to fulfill roles from indirect fire support to anti-tank, and can be armed with mortars, 50 caliber machine guns, and tank caliber cannons. In an anti-tank role, the Marker is also equipped with up to four anti-tank missiles capable of defeating up to 800 mm of explosive reactive armor, making them lethal even against the most modern tanks. And all these capabilities come at a fraction of the cost and risk to human lives as a real tank. Yet, ground robots require a human operator which can be eliminated, and a secure communications link which can be jammed or even used to hack the robot itself. As the US found out early in the war in Afghanistan when Taliban insurgents hacked into the camera feeds of a loitering Predator drone using off-the-shelf software. While they remain an appealing option, the vulnerability to hacking and electronic warfare, especially against a technologically sophisticated enemy, makes ground robots currently a very risky investment. In the end, ground combat robots are currently a risky proposition. If used successfully, they could help nations like Russia, which find themselves increasingly outclassed militarily, maintain some level of firepower parity, but if overused, can threaten to become a public opinion nightmare due to the inevitable high level of civilian casualties they could generate as frontline combatants. Those same casualties, if inflicted by human troops, can still be troubling, but our deeply seated fear of unmanned robots makes us especially sensitive to human deaths at the hands of a machine. 
With Russia's historically poor concern for collateral damage, ground combat robots could either be a strategic safeguard against NATO's growing military sophistication or an unmitigated political crisis. Only time will tell. Do you think we should use more robots in warfare or less? Why or why not? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Why the US Military Can't Upgrade from Windows XP. Thanks for watching and as always, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.